Alrighty, welcome along to my fellow strange historians and time travelers. How is everybody doing tonight? Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Strange History Society's study group. For all the FBI agents who are tuning in tonight, this isn't a normal show. It's not even worth your time. You don't need to listen. We're not doing anything weird. Calm down. Keep the head, <laughs> keep the black helicopters away from me. Don't bust down my door. We're just talking. We're just talking about strange history stuff. It's not just me. We participate. Everybody shares their info. So you can listen if you want to, FBI agents. You're more than welcome to. But trust me. You know what? Your life can't be too exciting. So what the hell? Hang out with us. In fact, if you are an FBI agent, go ahead and uh, leave a $500 super chat on behalf of the U.S. government. Wouldn't that be nice? Or if you could think of another way to identify yourself as an agent, um, go right ahead. Although I think we know a few ways, but already. Hey, everybody. What's up? Good to see you. Um, yes, the Strange History Society study group. Who is that? You guys tell me who that is. Is that me? It is. Is it you? It most certainly is. Is it the person to the left, to the right? It is. Everybody you see around you, that is us. It is our hangout. It is our club. You have found your place. You know you like strange history stuff. You love the whole Unabomber, Jack the Ripper, H.H. H. Holmes, all the cool stuff we talk about. You're into it, and it's cool. Not everybody is. Not everybody is, but we are. And so there we are. So listen, uh, we do an unusual show here. Uh, we want to become experts on stuff. We are not necessarily experts. We know a bunch. And we got a bunch of information and we share it. This ain't just me talking. It's you guys. You guys are a big part of it. So jump right into the chat. Add your thoughts. Add your theories. Add any information you have. And we will share it with each other. Does that sound cool? FBI is for what? Fun, beautiful, intelligent? <laughs> Since when? Really? Fun, beautiful, intelligent? Maybe. Maybe, maybe there's a, uh, is there a competitor to the FBI? There's the fun, beautiful, intelligent kind. And then there's the, um, oh, we won't say. All righty. So let's begin by thanking the great Linda, the great Brandy. And there's no doubt that the great Cat Ninja is here someplace. Cat Ninja, I've not seen you yet, but you've got to be here. Cat Ninja does not miss a show. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, you guys. How are you all? So good to see everybody. So, Cat Ninja, Cat Ninja. Am I missing Cat Ninja? Cat Ninja's got to be here someplace. Maybe in the litter box. Maybe. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan, that it's, it's possible that that's what FBI stands for. It's possible, but, uh, but I won't say. Anyway, listen, uh, last night we had fun. Yesterday I announced my goal of getting a hundred one dollar super chats in a month i know it's big i know it's a big uh, ask for me to earn a hundred dollars in a month through super chats it's never happened yet some of my friends earn like fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars a night can you believe that in super chats and some of you give them money you're giving money to people that earn fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars because you know they need it <laughs> they need it Hey, here's my hundred dollars. Oh, I wasn't acknowledged. Here's my tw another twenty. Acknowledge me, right? I have a goal. I have a goal. It's not fifteen hundred a night. It's not three thousand. It's a hundred dollars a month. I think I could pull it off. If if the stars align, if the gods are looking down upon me, I think it could happen. But who knows? Anyway, let's um let's get rolling. We call them time travel tokens. Anyway, I have coffee. I do. And I don't know what you guys have, but I'm waiting for you to reveal because now is the time when you, my fellow time travelers, my fellow strange historians, should most certainly sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of mead. If you enjoy mead, certainly grab a mug. There's plenty of ways to drink mead. There's plenty of ways. In fact, when you drink your tea, you enjoy your tea out of a mug, 
you enjoy it out of a glass. What is the proper vessel in your mind to drink tea? Coffee goes in a mug. There's no way around that, right? If you go somewhere and they give you a plastic cup, right, or a cardboard cup, carry your own cup with you. Carry your own cup. In fact, soon we will have a strange historian society mug for you to be able to pour your coffee in. Oh, oh, that would be cool. Yeah, we got to work on that. Anyway, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of mead or a chalice of cider or a flagon. Most certainly a flagon. Grab your flagon. Do not grab somebody else's flagon without their permission, especially these days. You get in a lot of trouble. So make sure you have it in writing that you can grab somebody else's flagon and fill it with any beverage of your choice and join all of us around the campfire. Tea in a porcelain cup. Yes, I agree with that, MJ. Most certainly. A Klein bottle. I don't even know what the hell that is. What's a Klein bottle? You know what I never add? A stein. What should I? What should we put in a stein? It has to have an S sound, right? Because, you know, you got the cup of coffee, tankard of tea, mug of mead, chalice of cider. You guys know I have an unhealthy obsession with alliteration and accidents and consonants and that sort of thing. So, yes, if we do have a stein... What kind of sounding stuff can we put in it? You guys have to decide. This is a collective decision. I will not make this decision by, on my own. Hey, Zen, thank you for inviting into the... Oh, yes, it's a magical place. You are most certainly welcome. Everybody's welcome here. It is magical. It is fun. You know what's fun? Do you guys ever take the time? Thank you, by the, by the way, for the time travel tokens. You ever read the comments in our shows you ever read them and everybody else's it's like they're bitching about the subject matter right they're bitching about whatever the hell it is right and ours is always like this is a cool show this is fun love the chat this is great so exciting hi from the future it's so cool i'm so glad that everybody's in a good mood and that we're hanging out and that you know we have just the type of show where we could be very cash and you guys hear me making all kinds of noises you know why i do that i don't want this to be overly you know you know, hi, everybody. This is Ken. Welcome to Strange History Society. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the Unabomber. So join me for another episode of Strange History. Come on. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't do that. Anyway, hey, Terry, you look, you work very hard for your tokens. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very kind of you. Yes, tokens are not so easy to come by in my world. No one seems to know why. They seem to hide from me. Nobody wants to give uh, Scott Cardinal time travel tokens. He thinks that time travel is, that people think, oh, time travel, that, snap your fingers. What does that cost? No, you got a machine. You got to keep it clean. You got to wipe stuff down. You got to have a little bit of a staff, a little bit. They don't, don't worry. Nobody will reveal anything. But, you know, you got to have a little staff to help you out, keep the thing, you know, clean of dust, that sort of stuff. Hey, Lori. Above, I had written what I knew about the Unabomber. Just thought I'd let you know I'm 80 miles from where he lived. Really? He had me over for cookies. Wait, what? I got to look up and see what Lori wrote. You mean when he was living in the, in the, um, in the cabin? Really? That's pretty cool. Had you over for cookies. Imagine, imagine if he said, um, hi, Lori, come on in. Uh, sit back yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea that would have been a problem all right i gotta see what laurie wrote i gotta find it hold on this might take me a second give me 10 seconds hey diane thank you for the time traveler tokens much appreciated all right let me see if i could find what you wrote how long ago did you write it laurie let me look up 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 up, up. she had cookies with the unabomber that's pretty cool has anybody ever had cookies with a murderer, or or it doesn't have to be cookies. When I say cu cu uh, cookies, it's all encompassing. It could be muffins, it could be a cannoli, you name it. What you what about those cookies that are three colors? What are those called? Tricolored, right? You know they sell them like in Italian bakeries. You guys like that? You guys go, who likes a black and white cookie? When you eat a black and white cookie, this is a serious question. I should I should make this a poll. Do you like one side versus the other? Do you like, okay, I'll eat the vanilla side first, and then I'll eat the chocolate? Or do you eat, like, right down the middle? So you get half chocolate, 
half an hour while you're zooming through the cookie. All right, here we go. I found it. Um, anyway, thanks again, Diane. Appreciate it. All right, Laura. Unabomber Ted Kaczynski eventually moved to Lincoln, Montana, living in a cabin. 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 Let me get a cabin. All right, come on over. Have to come to my cabin. Have some cookies. No electricity or water. Lincoln is a tiny town in the Lewis and Clark Forest. Lewis and Clark were pretty freaking amazing. My God, what those guys did with, of course, assistance at the behest, at the behest of the genius Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, the racist. The genius Thomas Jefferson. I said it. Freaking genius. My God, what the world would be like today if had uh, Thomas Jefferson not existed. I shudder to think about it. So Lewis and Clark have their own forest. Pretty cool. All right, next. I'm 80 miles from there. Didn't hear much about him till the killing started. When the FBI bought the cabin uh, during its move, we saw it pass through our interstate. That's all I know. You know what's interesting? I'm going to read from the, uh, from the FBI's website. I came across it today, and they rebuilt the damn thing. I guess they, I, I could actually play that video. Hopefully the FBI, in fact, if there are any FBI agents, do me a favor, don't, don't give me a copyright strike. All right, I pay taxes like everybody else. All right, fellow American here, calm down. Don't give me a damn copyright strike because I play your freaking video. All right, but it's pretty cool. It's a, you know what? I should play it. Should I play it right now? We can get started. That may be a fun way to get started. But pretty cool, Lori. What kind of cookies were they? Were they black and white cookies? If they were black and white cookies, that is proof positive that we live in a computer simulation because I would have had no way to have known. Just saying. But yes, I definitely, did I thank Diane yet? I don't know. Well, if not, Diane, I thank you again. But thank you. Your dad would have loved this. Well, that's, uh, we're going to try to have some fun tonight and talk about this rather interesting subject matter, which 30% of you, as far as I know, Lori is pulling our leg. I don't think so. Nobody would lie about having cookies with the Unabomber. I'm just saying. Thanks, Anne, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. Hey, oh, Mystery Christy. I like that name. Thank you very much for the time travel tokens. Much appreciated as always. In fact, you know, Scott, what do you do with all those time travel tokens? Well, not much. I'm just saying, I actually have a new animation coming out because as we know, I'm going to be reading a whole bunch of the articles from the Jack the Ripper stuff. I mean, I got a whole bunch. So I had a animation made with uh, like Victorian England. And that'll be up, probably I'll do it tonight after this show ends. So it'll be up tonight. A Stout and a Stein. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Anne. Stout and a Stein. That is right up my alley to say it like that. That is very Danny Kayish. Very Danny Kayish. All right, you know what? Should I show you guys that first? I'll show you this cool video because I don't want to forget to do it. So give me a sec. Let's pull that up. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, why don't I show you what we're going to talk about? How's that sound? Okay, so the Unabomber, right? So we're going to talk about, you know, do an introduction. By the way, did you guys know there were dolls made of the Unabomber? If anybody has a doll, please let me know. That's so, I mean, I don't even, I would love to know how the doll thing works because is this or is this not? Uh, could he sue over that? Could he say, listen, this is, this, that's my face. Is it his face? Is it not his face? What do you think's going on with this? That, do you think that can't, you know what? Forget this for a second. Do you think that Mattel or whoever the hell did this, Hasbro, anybody, do you think that there should be Unabomber dolls? Do you think that's the sort of thing that, because they're obviously real. I mean, here's three of them right here, and clearly from three different companies. Now, I mean, are there any, if anybody wants to research, remember, this is a study group. This is a study group. This ain't just on me, you guys. This is on you two. Help me out. Have there been any other dolls of mass murderers, serial killers, any kind of criminals throughout history, like real criminals? How, do you guys know... Is there a Ted Bundy doll? Is there a Son of Sam doll? Is there a Charles Manson? It was probably a Charles Manson doll. Is there 
uh, you know, the, and the women, right, who were with Charles Manson. What about that lady down in Florida? What was her name? You know, she was the prostitute and she would murder the men. The hell was her name? You guys know who that was? And Christina Ricci was in that movie, which is the only reason I saw it, because she's topless in her underwear. underwear. I'm kidding. You don't have to go out of your way to see Christina Ricci in her underwear. No bra. It seems to be in her contract to put her in that. Um, but anyway, it's actually a good movie. And But are there any others? Are there any other dolls like that with mass murderers? And what do you think about that? So we'll talk about his childhood. People tuning in for the first time are like, what the hell? Is it, I thought this would be a serious show. It is serious. It is serious. But there's like 10 gazillion freaking videos about this guy. You want me to do it like that? Project Ultra was a secret and illegal mind control program conducted by the CIA in the U.S. Come on. No, we're cool here. We're hanging out. We're sitting on sofas. We're drinking coffee. We're enjoying some mead. There's, there's Vlad Putin doll. Vlad Putin? Vladimir. Vladimir Putin dolls? Are there really? Outside of Russia? You know what? Are there any like dolls about like Van Gogh or Picasso? Is, is there a series of dolls with stuff like that? Um, we'll talk about Harvard, which is, by the way, beautiful. Has anybody been to Harvard? Have you been to Harvard? Anybody graduate from Harvard? I've actually been here where this photo was taken. Harvard, Yad. Harvard. Don't think they don't talk like that. That's how they talk there. Harvard. And um, they all talk like Kennedy's. But Harvard's beautiful. And then we're going to talk about this place. That's where Mr. Kaczynski lived when he was 15. No, I'm sorry, 16 years old. He was, a, he was, a, he was accepted into Harvard at, when he was 15, but he went there at 16. And rather than having him live in the dorms right away, they put him in there. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about the psychological study that was done to him, which is pretty ugly. And then we'll talk about his mathematics career. Did you know that Ted Kaczynski had this, I think relatively the same IQ as Einstein and that guy in a wheelchair? What the hell's his name? Hawkins, Hawkins, Stephen something. Nobody ever knows his last name. Is it Hawkins or Hawkins? Does anybody know without looking it up if there's a G or not? I don't think anybody knows. I don't think if somebody offered you a million dollars, you could definitively say if there's a G or not. Nobody knows. Maybe you do. I don't. Hawkins, Hawkins. You know who that is? The guy in the wheelchair? All right. And then we'll talk about his life in Montana. And then we'll talk about the bombings, of course. Hawkins. Is it Hawkins? And then we'll talk about the bombings. We'll talk about the FBI, our wonderful FBI. That does, they're so credible. They do such a great job. We'll talk about them and the wonderful things they do. And then we'll talk about later bombings, because you know we stopped for a while. And then we'll talk about that manifesto. I am going to read. <laughs> so, so, so there's an early dispute. G or no G? I, now I'm going to have to look it up. I don't know who to please. <laughs> we'll talk about the manifesto. And if you guys want, I will read some of the manifesto. There's no way I can read all of it. There's no way. However, in my very brief uh, search on YouTube, I think there was only one person I think that took the time to actually read it and it got a hell of a lot of freaking views. So if only one, and I didn't listen to it, so I don't even know, but, but I don't mind doing it. Not tonight, but if people want to hear it, I read it long time ago. I think I read it when I was like 24 years old, I think, right? Like when I got out of college and are you like me? Did you ever read it? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 I agree with that too. Uh huh, uh huh. Yep, 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 yep. Mm hmm. Yep, Ted. Yep, yep, definitely Ted. Got it. Yep, yep, you got it, Ted. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Who, who wrote this? Hold a second. This is good stuff here. This guy's a killer. But anyway, um, we'll read some of that. We'll talk about the investigations, talk about his arrest, and we'll talk. He's got good hair. Listen. If, if there was ever a top 10 list, okay, and I say this in all sincerity, this is serious, this isn't me joking around. If you made a list of the top 10 great best hair, 
right? Like, you know, the best hair in rock and roll is like usually David Bowie, right? That guy had great hair. But if you made a list of the top 10 serial killers, most of them had really good hair, right? And notice that's never in FBI profiles, right? That I ever see or FBI. They're not like, yeah, okay, it's dyed. But either way, it's like, it's a nice thick hair. That's like a nice, that's a good set of hair, right? And I don't know what, you know, once you're in prison, there's no way you're using good hair anymore, right? They're using, you know, all the prel that the government bought you know, in 1974, and they, they still have it. But it's good hair. It's good hair. And then we'll talk about his guilty plea and why he did that. And then we'll talk about his incarceration, which I thought was interesting. In fact, that'll be an interesting conversation because I he had some interesting friends, which I didn't think you could have when you're in yourself for 23 hours a day. But we'll talk about that. I think that's it. Okay. Too scary for you? What, is hair? The hair is too scary? Genetics for full hair. Yeah. So I don't know. Who else would you, if we were going to make a list, top 10 best hair of mass murderers and serial killers, you could limit it to serial killers if you want. But I say mass murderers, serial killers, you could throw some other people in there if you want. But talking about some good hair. All right, let's get going, shall we? So... What we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through this dude's life. And then, is there anything to show you? Yeah, we got the dolls. Did anybody find out yet if there are other dolls of serial killers? Just go on Google. Some of you can do it. Type up serial killer dolls and let us know. Bundy and Ramirez, is there really? Oh, my God. All right. There's got to be more. There's got to be more than them. So, yes, go ahead and put that in the chat, even if I don't see it. Remember, the information you share is for each other, not just me. Lon Chaney Jr., what about him? He wasn't a serial killer. He was a werewolf. Werewolves aren't necessarily serial killers, though. All right, so the Unabomber, that was not his name, just in case you thought, oh, my God, what a weird name. You know, what is he, one of, uh, you know, is he related to Kanye West? Isn't Kanye's kids like, you know, north, south, east, and west or something like that? So the Unabomber, whose real name is Theodore. It's not even Ted. We're going to call him Ted. Wait a minute. Should we call him Ted? Because if we ever do a show on Ted Bundy, nah, because we'll, when we do a show on Ted Bundy, we'll, talk, we'll call him Ted too. But at that time, we'll be talking about Ted. So his name is Theodore John Kaczynski. He is considered to be, well, he's definitely American, a domestic terrorist who conducted a bombing campaign that lasted from the late 1970s to the mid-1990s. And his targets were universities, airlines, and computer stores, and some other stuff, too. TED Talks. By the way, he's still alive. He never got put to death. He's 80 years old. Did you guys know that? Uh, Kaczynski was born in 1942. In Chicago, all good things come out of Chicago. We know that. And he was a mathematics prodigy. This dude earned, I'm just giving you an overview right now. We'll get more detailed in a second. But he earned a PhD in mathematics from the University of Michigan, which for those who don't know, that's no easy feat, right? I know it sounds like Michigan, who wants to go there? Nah, that's a good school. That's a good freaking school, University of Michigan. I'm not sure why. Does anybody know? why University of Michigan is such a good school? I'd be Actually, I'd be very interested to know if anybody could answer that. Because you say to yourself, what's well, Michigan? Is it because you had so many wealthy people that live there or near there, and they just funneled a ton of money into that school in order for them to hire great professors? Because it seems like an unusual place, right? Um, and I'll give you a, a weird example. I had friends that went to a college in Florida they have two different locations, or maybe more, but it's called Florida International, Florida, Inter Florida International University. And they've got a North Campus, and they've got a, another campus somewhere. And the, um, the CIA actually used them, used the campus to, for the um, preparation for the Bay of Pigs inv um, invasion, right? And so I had some friends that went there, for culinary school. You guys know what culinary school is, right? 
And, and one of my friends said when he went there, it was the best school in the country for that. And I said, what? I said, how is that possible? I mean, because you've got the CIA. I mean, you know, the Culinary Institute of America. Where's that? In upstate New York. So you've got the Culinary Institute. You've got to have a ton of really great culinary schools in the United States. How the hell could this college, that, who the hell ever heard of, in Miami have, at the time anyway, the number one culinary school in the country for, for, for however long a time that was, you know, because it changes all the time. And he said to me, he said, well, what happened is there were so many people that ran restaurants and You know, just like, all right, well, this is fine, but, you know, how long can I sit at the beach? And they actually started going to the college and said, you know, I ran, you know, 90 restaurants or whatever, and, uh, you know, I'm a chef or whatever. And so they, I guess they just started working. And so this school just had all these great people that under normal circumstances. If anybody knows. I'd be interested. So and he became a professor at University of California at Berkeley. And then he resigned. Efficient. He wanted to be isolated. And so that's, you know, that's why. Let's go Gators. Uh, I don't know if that was their mascot. I think Gators are... Gainesville, right? University, what is that called? I mean, of course, there are Gators still down in Miami, but either way. I'm cutting out? Am I really? Testing, testing? Okay. No. There's no reason why. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay. That should fix that. All right, sorry about that. Okay. I'm back, yeah. You know, I told you guys why this happens. I have something called Backblaze, which backs up my ex my external hard drive. Wait, yeah, backs up my hard drive into the cloud, as they say, the cloud. And I have to turn it off because it takes up so much bandwidth. So I turn it off. All right, okay. So where do we leave off? Uh, da, 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 target. Uh, da. Move to okay. okay. So in 1978, he started mailing bombs to people, uh, individuals, organizations, and he did it for 20 years. Right? Uh, he didn't kill as many people as I thought. How many? How many people do you think he killed? He only. I don't want to say only because I mean it sucks that he killed anybody, but he killed three people. Now he injured a hell of a lot of a lot of freaking people. All right. So don't let's get that straight. He injured a hell of a lot of people and scared the hell out of a lot of people. But all things considered, he killed three, right? And the FBI uh, gave the case the nickname Unibomb, right? Because he was a university and airline bomber. I don't know if it was Unibomb or Unibomber. I've seen that twice. Because those are, you know, who he chose to go after, you know, universities and, and airlines. So the FBI supposedly... They said, you guys help me figure out what this means. They said that at the time, it was the most expensive investigation in FBI history, involving hundreds of agents and resources. Now, I want, whenever I hear stuff like that, like, uh, you know, the police, right? It's like, oh, the most expensive. How is it expensive if it's the same freaking people going to work every day? They're getting paid anyway. And it's not like the FBI, especially now, has anything else to do, Right. I mean, God knows, you know, what else do they have to do? So it's like, what, what, what is it that makes it expensive? Uh, FBI agent Fred and Bill and Stephanie and Henry are going to work, punching in, right? Like Fred Flintstone at the quarry. And it's like, okay, what do you got for me today? Oh, yeah, we're going to do the Ted Kaczynski thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Would they not have a job if they weren't working on the Ted Kaczynski case? I mean, I don't understand that. Is it, oh, is it because of overtime? Oh, do they do that? Is that is it an overtime thing? When you work for the FBI, they, they're not working by the hour. This is they're not at, at Taco Bell working the, uh, you know, the drive-in. I assume it's a salary. It's like, look, here's your, 
you know, $150,000 a year and get the freaking work, you know, and leave when you're done. And that's that. So I don't understand stuff like that. If you guys want to help me figure out why it's why things like that, the most expensive blah, blah, blah in history, you know, when it's people that are just doing their damn jobs. I don't understand it. I could be wrong. You guys help me understand what that means. So they found out that he may be suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, what do you guys think? We'll, we'll talk about that. And sentenced to life imprisonment without parole in 1998. So let's talk about his childhood, shall we? And these cool dolls. Are we? Can we move on from the dolls? Inflate the numbers to exaggerate the crime? Yeah. No donuts. Do you think he could possibly have been the bank robber that jumped out of the plane and escaped? What was that guy's name? That was, uh, he had initials or something. I, I don't even, I don't really know too much about that. I don't know the name of that. Werewolves of London. Jonathan, you're on a different thing today. We will, we will do Werewolves of London. Uh, that story, maybe in Halloween. But we shall see. D.B. Cooper. Exactly. Thanks, you guys. All right, so Unabomber dolls. If anybody has one, please let us know. Let's talk about his childhood, shall we? Cute kid. Like I mentioned, born in Chicago on May 22nd, 1942. Parents were working class. His dad, don't take this the wrong way, people. Don't take it the wrong way. His dad was a sausage maker. I don't know what that means. I don't want to know what it means. I will say this. There is a quote out there that says, if you knew how sausage was made, you'd never eat a sausage, right? <laughs> sausage. But his dad, that was his dad's job, making sausage. How do you even make, isn't, isn't that a machine, I hope? How is, it, how is it somebody's job? Does anybody have a relative who's a sausage maker? Anyway, that's what his dad did. Um, his dad was Polish, his mom was Polish, they were Catholic. So, and they became atheists. Uh, so check this out. His IQ, when he was in sixth grade, sixth grade, 167. What the hell is that? 167 IQ in sixth grade. Good freaking gosh. How in the world do you, what do you do with something like that? What do you do when you have a, a child in sixth grade? I don't know what they call sixth grade in the UK, right? But how old is a, is a kid in sixth grade? Anybody know in America? How old is that? Is that uh, six, seven years old? But 167, that's a genius. That's a genius, right? And by the way, I want to talk about that later because when it comes to things like prison reform, and prisoner reform, and you have a genius like this, what do you do with somebody like that when they, if they get arrested for a crime? Do you really put somebody like that in a supermax prison when he's in no danger at all to himself? I mean, to, you know, he's not making bombs ever again. That's not happening. Do you really put somebody like that, despite his crimes, despite his crimes, do you, do you, because you, you can't forget that, but what do you do with somebody like that? Do you really put somebody like that in a jail cell for 23 hours a day? And when they come out for an hour, it's just to walk around in a courtroom, uh, in a courtyard for an hour. I, or, or do you say, well, we got this genius and he kept himself hidden from the world for so long and now we got him. And now maybe we can get some value out of this brilliant mind. Remember, Stephen Hawkins, right, or Hawkins, whatever the hell his name is, and Einstein. That's the genius level that this guy is at. I got a typo of his name. Stephen Hawking. Okay, it's, there's a G. There's a G. And everybody knows this guy was brilliant. So Stephen Hawking was a genius, and Einstein were geniuses. And this guy's a genius. What do you do with that? It's kind of like reminds me, most of you have probably seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, right, with Leonardo DiCaprio and that Tom Hanks dude. And if you read his book, it's even more interesting. Read the book. The movie's fine. Enjoy the movie. But read the book. But 
what they did with him, which was really fascinating, is, you know, he had this great knowledge, right, on, on fraud, on bank fraud. And, and the FBI is like, you know, we got this guy locked in jail forever. And meanwhile, he knows more about this than we do about this crime and about fraud and, and you know, cause he sees it from this direction and it's like, all right, well, we can forget about them or we can say, Hey, why don't you help us out? You know, and let's get some value out of this because in the long run, it'll help more people. Now, granted he wasn't a killer, you know, but either way, it's just something to think about. And I have no idea what the answer is. I'm just saying that it just seems a shame that if you have somebody that's so brilliant, the idea of just putting him in, in jail. So he got he got uh, pushed ahead in school, and he didn't fit in with older children, and they kind of bullied him a little bit. I can I can't relate to that. Can anybody relate to that? I was actually ahead of everybody else when I was in school. I was when I was fifteen. I was actually in twelfth grade. Okay, fifteen years old. Nobody else was freaking fifteen. Let me tell you. All my friends were like 17, 18 years old. I was 15. And, and I already looked young and the rest of it. But I never got bullied. Nobody ever messed with me. You know, maybe because I made jokes and, and stuff like that. But it didn't go so well for him. And so he did get bullied. He was isolated and the rest of it. But good God, he was gifted. In fact, he was put in a gifted program when he was 10 years old. Right? And he just couldn't relate to his peers and this isn't just Ted Kaczynski, by the way. When you're dealing with people, I mean, history has shown this. When you have somebody that's really, really brilliant, how in the world are they supposed to relate? What was the name of that movie about that guy? There's two guys wrote it. Um, and he's a janitor at, at, at ha actually at Havid, wasn't it? He was a, um, he was a janitor. You know, the, the scene, how do you like them apples? That scene. What was the name of that movie? He's some smart dude. And he's a janitor at Harvard. And there was outside in the hallway, there was a blackboard. And the professor put up some impossible mathematical equation. And he says to all of it, Goodwill Hunting, thank you. Thanks, you guys. And he says, I think every year for, how, what was it, five years, 10 years, 20 years, however the hell long that guy was a professor, he said, look, I've got this outside. If anybody can solve it, you know, I don't know, buy your basket of fruit, you know, whatever the hell that was. And, and then one day he comes back and he sees, what was it? This janitor was answering the equation, right? And he's chasing them and all that. And he's like, whoa, 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 you know, what are you doing? And nothing. He's like, yeah, I answered it. And what was interesting is there was some kind of conversation where he said there's only three, wasn't it? I don't remember. I only saw the movie one time. So I'm just grabbing what I, I can out of my memory. But then he say something among the lines of, there's only three people in the world that could answer this equation, that could solve this equation, and I'm one of them. And that was the professor saying that, obviously. And it's like he's been searching his whole life to try to find somebody else who would have that kind of ability. And then it's this dude. It's the janitor, right? And so I was reading something today during my research for this show. And, and Ted Kaczynski, at some point in college, he wrote something. And the professor, at least one professor said, there's only maybe, I think it said less than 25 people in the entire country who could even understand what the hell he wrote, right? And then not because it was crazy, it was because it was brilliant. Imagine having such a high level of intelligence that there's less than whatever, let's say a dozen people, a couple dozen people in the entire country who can understand what the hell you wrote, right? So how is somebody like that supposed to relate to people? How, how you, you can't help but be sympathetic, right? Because what do you do with this, right? It's like any kid, a lot of you probably know, right? You meet some protégés, you meet some uh, a kid who plays guitar, you know, anything some incredible skills, some incredible level of int intelligence. How do you relate to that, right? My whole life, I was always a kind of a big defender of Michael Jackson, right? Think what you want about Michael Jackson. And people say, oh, he's weird, he's weird. And I used to say, even when I was a kid, I said, how the hell do you expect him to be normal? How do you expect Michael Jackson, who started working when he was, I think, five, 
and famous when he was eight. How the hell do you, how do you call somebody like that a weirdo? Like it's, like it's his fault, right? They never had a chance to be normal, right? And so it's like, all right. So you have somebody like Ted Kaczynski, who at 10 years old is gifted, right? Sixth grade, an IQ of what? What did I say? 169, whatever it was. Is that what it was? And it's like, how the hell do you expect somebody like that? How do you expect to relate to him? And so it must have been very traumatizing, especially for the parents. I mean, dad's a sausage maker for crying out loud. He probably didn't even know what the hell to do with him, right? When you have somebody with that amount of skill. What was the name of that movie? What's that guy's name? It's a true story. He was a pianist, right? Pianist, pianist. He played the piano, right? And um, he played the piano. It was called Shine. You know the movie Shine? Anybody see that movie? Shine. Who saw Shine? Don't type Shine in Google, by the way. Pulls up weird things. Okay. Uh, it was about David, David Helfgott. Anybody know who David Helfgott is? This was a great movie. And it starred, who the hell was the star of that? Jeffrey Rush. Jeffrey Rush. So David Helfgott, holy cow, he's still alive. This guy was incredible, right? Genius. And, but, you know, music, music wise, right? And so, and, and they discovered it pretty early on. And I think his parents were like, well, what the hell? Oh, they're Polish also. Interesting. Wow. See, let me tell you something. Don't make fun of our friends in Poland. These are freaking some smart people, right? Smart freaking people. Good for the Poles. But either way, that was a great movie. And he also was a, a protege. And he was doing, you know, like a Rachmaninoff and, and just it, the list was endless. Like this guy could do anything. And it's like, and then he, he, he went crazy, didn't he? He went crazy. Say pianist, pianist. I'm not saying it, Haley. Leave me alone. Pianist, pianist. Is it pianist or pianist? Do you say, do you do with the ah or do you do the e? P. Pianist, P, P, and get you, keep your keep your keep your minds out of the gutter, you guys. We're talking about uh, piano here, but is it pianist or is it pianist? You guys tell me. Anyway, let's get going. FBI agents are like, I'm getting paid to listen to this guy. You know what, you guys say something to all the FBI agents that are listening, so that it takes the heat off of me. Tell them this is a normal show. Relax. Say, say, say hi to our friends in the FBI listening. I don't know why they have to listen. Uh, da, 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 da. He wanted to spend his time alone. Anyway, his parents were worried about his social skills and when he was like 12 years old. And so they sent him to a child psychologist, which back then, even a psychologist probably were, you know, smart people and not a bunch of weirdos. And now, you know. You'd have to be crazy to send your kid to a freaking psychologist. Who knows what they'll do? They'll come back thinking that they're a bird, and the, and then the, and the, you don't accept that they're a bird. And next thing you know, the psychologist is reporting you, and you're being arrested because you're not allowing your son to, and daughter to have feathers attached to their body, or who the hell knows? All right, high school. In high school, he played the trombone. Did anybody here play the trombone? Is it pianist? You know what? I can't even trust you guys. You get, are you sure? I don't know. You guys have fun with me trying to get me to say it the wrong way, I think. Pian pianist. 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 All right. So he's, uh, he's playing the trombone. He's in a marching band. He's a member of the mathematics, the biology, the coin, and the German clubs. Isn't that exciting? Don't tell me that doesn't sound exciting to you, to be in high school, to be a member of the math club, the biology club, the coin club, and the German club. And for those of you who have been listening for a long time, you probably know where I'm going next, don't you? Yes. Some of you ladies, some of you ladies are expecting me to make fun of somebody who's in the mathematics, biology, coin, and German clubs. That's what you think is going to happen, don't you? Yeah. Hey, Kathy, thanks for the super sticker. Much appreciated. The time travel tokens, as we call them here. Much appreciated. Well, 
Some of you ladies might even think that you are Claire Standish. Does anybody know who Claire Standish is? Anybody? She would say something like, you know why guys like you knock everything? Oh, this should be stunning. It's because you're afraid. Oh God, you Richies are so smart. That's exactly why I'm not into heavy into activities. You're a big coward. I'm in the math club. That's uh, Ted Kaczynski saying he's in the math club. And then Claire says, see, you're afraid that they won't take you. You don't belong, so you have to just dump all over it. Well, it won't have anything to do with your activities, people being assholes, now would it? Well, you wouldn't know. You don't even know any of us. Well, I don't know any lepers either, but I'm going to go out and run to one of their fucking clubs. Hey, let's watch the mouth, huh? I'm in the physics club, too. Excuse me a second. What are you babbling about? That's Brian Johnson, by the way. Well, what I said is I'm in the math club, uh, the Latin club, and the physics, the, the physics club. Come on, some of you guys have got to know where this is from by now. How You never see all the breakfast club? Come on, guys, the breakfast club. Claire Standish was Molly Ringwald. John Bender, Brian Johnson. Well, what I said is I'm in the math club, uh, the Latin club, and the physics club, the, the physics club. Hey, Jerry, do you belong to the physics club? That's an academic club. So? So academic clubs aren't the same as other kinds of clubs. Ah, but to dorks like him, they are. What do you guys do in your club? Oh, well, in physics, we, we talk about physics, proprieties of physics. So it's sort of social, demented and sad, but social, right? All right, guys. So who back me up, you guys. There's got to be people here to sort the breakfast club. And there's no way you're just letting me go off on this. You got a bunch of 25-year-old FBI agents saying, what the hell is this guy talking about? All right, fine. Let's move on. Here at high school, Kaczynski was ahead of his classmates mathematically and academically. He skipped the 11th grade and he attended summer school. He graduated when he was 15 years freaking old. Kaczynski won all kinds of awards and they said, you know what, dude, you need to go to Harvard. And he's like, Harvard? And they said, no, Harvard. You mean Harvard? He's like, no, Harvard. And he's like, all right. And so when he was 15 years old, he was accepted into Harvard. He entered the university on a scholarship when he was 16 years old. Incredible, right? So let's go ahead and jump over to that. Oh, that was him in high school. Not a bad looking dude, right? He's all right. There's Harvard, beautiful Harvard. So check this out. I thought this was pretty interesting. So he didn't even have a driver's license, right? Packed him up, sent him off to Harvard, like he's ready to roll. And he's not the most social dude the world's ever known. And so what the people at Harvard thought is, well, he's not the only one. You got lots of young people here, lots of geniuses. And it's not fair to put him in the dorms where everybody's older than him and he's going to feel isolated. And so what they did is they have this house. It's located at 8 Prescott, uh, 8 Prescott Street. And it was the reason for it was that young students could live in there and they can kind of hang out. But what do you guys think? Do you think this was a good idea or a bad idea? Because you're grabbing a bunch of, what, 15, 16-year-olds that are really shy, socially awkward, and you're like, you're throwing them all together. What do you think that's like? You think that, you think that was Party City? You think this became Animal House at one point? No. What they say is that, what they say is that uh, it just isolated them further and that People that lived there would just hide in their rooms. And so there's that. Hey, Rachel, just to say I'm 25 and watch The Breakfast Club. Rachel, you are the coolest 25-year-old uh, that's alive today, just so you know. Very cool. It's a great movie, right? It sucks that you couldn't have been, like, I don't know. How cool must it have been? Was anybody the age of the students when Breakfast Club came out? When was that? 84, 85? So you would have had to have been born in what, 68, 69, 70, whatever. Was anybody around that age? Because that had to have been great to have all the, because in the 80s, 
you had John Hughes and he was pumping out these movies and how cool must it have been to be able to see these movies made that kind of reflected your life as it was, you know, you know, middle, middle class America, whatever. And it's like, how cool must have that have been? It's like little mini documentaries, right? And so that's kind of cool. So thank you, Rachel. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you for the time travel tokens. In fact, I will use some of the time travel tokens to take Rachel back to 1984, 1985. I will take Rachel to the movie and we will watch The Breakfast Club as teenagers. Wouldn't that be fun? So, thanks, Rachel. That didn't sound too creepy, did it? That sound creepy? All right. Hope not. All right. So he was in Harvard. This dude was having difficulty socializing. And so, you know, but he, listen, he was brilliant. And everybody knew it. And he, uh, they put him in these dorms finally, so he was there. Now, check this out. Here's where things get really, really creepy. So he was involved in his second year at Harvard. Kaczynski participated in a study that was described as, and this is a quote, purposely brutalizing psychological experiment. And it was led by Harvard psychologists. See, these colleges get so much freaking moolah, right? And a lot of times they do horrible things, you know, uh, to experiment. They give the professors money. It's like, oh, go do this, right? You, you remember the studies about what was that one thing that they did where they took some of the students and they said, well, we're going to put them in uniforms, right? And the other ones aren't. And the people that were in, student, that were in uniforms just became these brutal freaking jerk-offs right? Even though they're all the same age, everything's fine, but the simple act, because I think they were trying to figure out, well, what the hell happened in Nazi Germany? What caused neighbors to, you know, say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, join the Nazi party. And next thing you know, they're walking around with their fancy outfit and they're in a club and they're beating the hell out of their neighbors. Like what the hell caused that? And it's like, well, you know, put them in a suit. So who knows? That was, um, but subjects were told that they would debate philosophy with fellow students and they were asked to write essays to detail their personal beliefs and aspiration. And the essays were given to individuals and what they would do is they would belittle the subjects, okay? Belittle them and they were abusive to them and just absolutely freaking awful. And then they used electrodes <clears throat> to monitor the subjects physiological reactions. How would you like to do that? Imagine you're a student. So what would he have been at the time? Like 17 years old, right? Not even 18. So 17, let's just say 17, 18 years old. And they, he's got electrodes attached to him and they're insulting him and belittling him. How would you like to deal with that at that particular age? Right? And so, and they, oh, and they film them in order to get the subject's expressions of anger and rage. And then they would play it back to them repeatedly. How would you like that? Imagine somebody put a camera on your face and they insulted you and belittled you over and over and over again. And then they put, they let you, then they made you over and over and over again, watch yourself, watch your reactions to constantly being insulted. Do you think that is a good recipe for creating a healthy and happy human? You think that's good? And Harvard tolerated this. This is the kind of thing that goes on, not just at Harvard. I mean, this is a thing all over the place. But who the hell does that? How the hell do you do that to other human beings, right? And so there was that, right? They're humiliating him. They're abusing him. Guess how long Ted Kaczynski was part of that study? You ready? You ready to find out? Check this out. 200 hours. 200 hours of this psychological study, 200 hours. So these were mind control techniques, by the way, right? And some people suggest that these experiments were part of Project MKUltra, which is the CIA's, do you guys know what MKUltra is? I don't wanna to talk too much about it because I don't need people at YouTube freaking out on me. I'll just very briefly talk about it. Project MKUltra, for those who don't know, was a secret and illegal mind control program conducted by the CIA in the United States. The CIA, I don't think, you guys can tell me, the CIA is not allowed to operate in the United States. That's not their deal. 
Don't you're not supposed to you do whatever the hell you want overseas, right? Spy, spy on our allies, spy on our enemies. Leave us the hell alone. But they didn't. And so this happened in the 1950s to the mid-1970s, or so they say. The program involved the use of various drugs, including LSD and other psychoactive substances, as well as other methods used such as hypnosis, uh, sensory deprivation, torture, to manipulate and control the behavior of individuals. That sound lovely, you guys? The project's stated goal was to develop techniques and substances that could be used for interrogations and to create a Manchurian candidate, a term used to describe a person who had been brainwashed to carry out an assassination or other covert action against their will. Do you guys believe that that's happened quite a number of times? Unusual, right? Every once in a while we hear about stuff like that, right? So, and there's been plenty of examples, but who knows, who knows? I'm sure they were just, you know, doing things in the best interest of all Americans and humanity as a whole. The project's been criticized, unethical, illegal, uh, obviously resulted in what? Severe psychological and physical harm to many of its subjects, right? Imagine how many people committed suicide. Yeah, Sir Han, Sir Han, the guy who shot John Lennon. You've got all these people. It's like, I don't remember. What do you mean? What? I did what? They automatically forget. Um, Anyway, the project was official, officially, officially, you guys, as long as it comes, as long as the U.S. government says it's official, we could take that to the bank and cash it. Don't worry about a thing. They officially halted it in 1973 after its uh, investigation was, uh, yeah, they were, an investigation revealed its existence. And uh, many of the program's documents were destroyed or remain classified. And its full extent and impact are still not fully understood. So it's interesting, right? So you have a guy like this who's antisocial. He's scared, right? He's easily manipulated because of his age. He has no real friends to talk to. He has no support system. He doesn't have anybody that he can relate to, right? He has nothing. He's in this whole other world. He has no family around, right? And so... This scumbag professor is like, yeah, grab Ted. Yeah, let's 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 have Ted be part of this. That'll be good. So, enough with that. Let's move on to his mathematics career. Oh, he graduated, of course. He earned a BA in mathematics from Harvard in '62. He had a GPA of 3.12. Some people might say, well, why wasn't it four? I think when you're a genius like that, this a lot of the classes that he took probably bored him to death. You know, probably didn't even pay attention. I think later on, he even got an F in a course. Sometimes you're just bored. You know, you hear that. Beatles reference number one. John Lennon, when he was a kid, I think that he said uh, nobody ever helped him. Nobody said to him, you know, you're smart. I think his quote was something like, why didn't anybody notice me? Why didn't anybody, like, encourage me? Why didn't anybody say, listen, you know, there's more to this than... You know, what are you going to do? Get a job as a barber, get a job as an electrician. You know, you have a creative way of thinking. You have, you know, there's, there's something more that you can do with yourself. Let's try to get, let's try to point you in the right direction. And John Lennon was very angry. You know, later on, he's like, why didn't anybody notice me? Why didn't anybody pick me out? And that's not how school is, right? I mean, it's a, it's a sausage factory, isn't it? You know, just like get them through. And how, are there any teachers here? Right. I mean, you, you probably go into the teaching career thinking this is great. I'm going to have this great impact on people. And if I if I see some genius or, you know, some smart kid or somebody that's in trouble, I'll help them. And maybe it's, maybe it starts off that way. But after a while, it's like it's too exhausting and you just show up and do your job and and get them through the system as quick as you can. And just, you know, just go through no fault of your own. But how much can you really do? And so. You have someone like Ted Kaczynski, and they just didn't know what the hell to do with him. And then he finally gets himself in a circumstance like Harvard, where you have professors who really can recognize his genius. And rather than saying, look, we've got a genius here. We could you know, shape him, and we could point him in different directions, and we can get this great career for him, and he's young, and there's so many things that we can do. Right? Like Doogie Howser, right? Which I never saw, but wasn't that... 
wasn't he like some 12 year old doctor or something crazy and so you would think they would do that like hey listen this is a great opportunity an opportunity like this doesn't come along often let's go ahead and embrace this this is a gift from the gods and rather than that they tortured they tortured him as a kid right we'll still call him a kid because he was under 18 right 16, 17 years old. Now let's mentally torture him. That's a better idea. Let's do that. Let's see how that goes. So, you know, he wasn't fortunate like a lot of other people were, right? He wasn't embraced and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't given a direction, sadly. So, uh, so anyway, he earns his degrees, which is great. And there was a professor named Alan Shields. And this is what he wrote about Kaczynski in, a, in an evaluation. This is a quote. He was the best man I have seen, right? Imagine you've got a professor and all the geniuses, all the brilliant people that come across through his life, right? That cross paths with him. And he said, no, that guy, Ted Kaczynski, he's the best of the best, right? Imagine that. So for a period of several weeks in 1966, this is a bit unusual also. In 1966, Ted experienced some sexual fantasies and he wanted to become a woman. He thought he was, he thought he should be female. So it's not just today, you guys, it's not just a today thing. Uh, for people watching in the future, be glad you're not around today. Oh my God. If you had any idea what we're dealing with, oh geez, it's a crazy time. But anyway, he had sexual fantasies of being a female. He decided to undergo gender transition. 1966, 1966, he wanted to become a woman. Did you guys know that? Is anybody learning this for the first time? Or did you know this? So he's, he made an appointment with a psychiatrist. You know what's interesting? Uh, Jordan Peterson just did a show on this, which was really fascinating. You guys want to check that out. It's pretty cool. Um so anyway, he makes an appointment with a psychiatrist, and while he's in the waiting room, he's in the waiting room, and he's like, you know what? I changed my mind. I don't think I want to undergo gender transition. I don't think I want to be a woman. Nah, leave me the hell alone. And I wonder if, when I was listening to Jordan Peterson today, he said something interesting. He said that a lot of people might be uncomfortable because they're gay and not want to deal with their family or friends, whatever it is, and that in their mind, subconsciously perhaps, they figure it actually might be more acceptable if I just became a woman. We're talking about gay men here. If I just became a woman, and then if I, you know, and now it's the trendy thing, right? Oh, my brother is a woman. It used to be a, he was a guy yesterday, but now he's a woman. And so it's this thing now. This is Jordan Peterson. This isn't Scott Cardinal. So Jordan Peterson saying that maybe that is part of what's going on, this, this thing that's going on right now. And so I wonder if Ted Kaczynski, perhaps, maybe he had, I don't know, you guys tell me, it's a study group, maybe he had homosexual tendencies and he thought that life would be easier if he just became a woman. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I guess talk, think about that. So he decided, so the psychiatrist is like, yeah, come on in, you know, what can I do for you? And he didn't tell him. He didn't even mention it. He's like, nah, I'm not going to say anything. But afterward, he got really pissed off. And he decided he wanted to kill the psychiatrist. That's not good, right? That's not good. So uh, he considered killing the psychologist and other people who he hated. And he said that that time was a major turning point in his life. And here's a quote from Ted. You ready? Or maybe he was abused. Maybe, maybe, you, you mean his dad may have had a bit, may have brought his interest in sausage home with him? Let's hope not. Let's hope that his dad kept his, his interest in sausage at work where it belonged. So here's a quote. I felt disgusted about what my uncontrolled sexual cravings had almost led me to do. And I felt humiliated and I violently hated the psychiatrist. Just then, there came a major turning point in my life. Like a phoenix, I burst from the ashes of my despair 
in a glorious new hope. Well, he was mentally abused. In fact, it's interesting that you guys are talking about mental abuse. Because yes, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. He, this guy was was um, was mentally abused. He went to freaking Harvard and they mentally abused the poor dude. Mentally, emotionally, right? Maybe perhaps physically, right? Who knows what they subjected this poor kid to. Uh, at the time, we could still say that, right? He didn't kill anybody. We're just talking about what was done to this kid. And then people are surprised when, you know, 10 years later or whatever, uh, people do horrible things. Well, you know what? You know what? Maybe maybe if this was part of some campaign, maybe this is what they wanted, right? If it was MK Ultra, it's like, well, yeah, hey, hey, worked out great. Worked out, hey, it works. It works, right? Um, yeah, um, Dog Day Afternoon, 1975. That was quite a story. <laughs> dog Day Afternoon. We could actually do a show on Dog Day Afternoon since that was based on a true story. So he wanted to kill a psychiatrist, and that gave him a whole new role in life. He's like, ah, I know what I'm going to do. So uh, it didn't really stop him, though, from being a genius. Obviously, this guy was brilliant. And his mathematics... Uh, dissertation won some big time award in 67 and so at 25 years old Ted became an acting assistant professor at the University of California at Berkeley where he taught mathematics you know even stuff like this when you talk about how young he is imagine he's 25 years old and he's an assistant professor at the university and even in a situation like that now he's surrounded by people who he's a little bit older than them Right. So you have students there that are 21, 22, 23, but he's still much younger than all the professors. So he's really thrust into an environment once again where he has almost no opportunity to socialize with people because anybody who's younger than him is a student. And he's just so way above them uh, intellectually. And other professors are, you know, older than him to whatever degree. And once again, he's the smartest dude in the room. Right. It's like being it's like being Elvis. Right. I know it's a bad example, but how the hell can Elvis relate to anybody? And it's kind of like this is Beatles reference number two. Uh, John Lennon, I think all of them said this, Paul, George, they said, I think even Ringo said it, was that the reason none of them went crazy and John Lennon, you know, but the reason none of them really went crazy is because they had each other, you know, where whereas Elvis was it was only him and nobody can relate to what he was going through. Whereas the four of them, they had each other and they could keep each other from going crazy because they, they all could, they could relate to what was happening to all of them at the same time. Who does Ted Kaczynski at 25 years old relate to? Who's he? Yeah, beaten dog is going to bite. Exactly. So this, he just nowhere to turn. Now, this is also the time, right? And so... We're talking about 66, 67. The whole world's changing. Imagine the types of students that are at Berkeley, for crying out loud, in 67, right? And so we're getting into 68. We're getting into 69. We're getting into the whole hippie thing. Everybody's running around naked and having sex and doing drugs and smoking pot and doing all kinds of things and wearing beads and, and dancing around in circles. And here's Ted, who at 25, 26 years old, is like an old man already, right? He's like an old man. I mean, think about it. At that point, he had been accepted into Harvard 10 years ago, right? And clearly no, no girlfriend, no children. I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for him, by the way. I mean, we know this. he did horrible things. But, but as part of our study group, don't we want to try to understand people like this? Because maybe it'll be helpful in the future, right? Let's try to, like, right? And look, if the FBI can profile people, we sure as hell can too. And we could probably do a better job of it. In fact, when I tell you later how they profiled the dude, I think we could do a better job. In fact, for all the FBI agents listening right now, ask the Strange History Society. We know all kinds of cool stuff. We could help. You never know. Yeah, Venice Beach is a whole vibe. Yeah. And so, yeah, Summer of Love. And so, once again, this guy just does not fit in. He's, he's Michael Jackson, right? He's, he's, he's anybody else like that. That when did he ever have a chance to be normal? When he was what? What did we say? Sixth grade. 
He had an IQ of 169. Now, that's when he was tested. Obviously, he had that freaking IQ when he was younger. It wasn't like, oh, sixth grade, you know, turn that switch on. All of a sudden, 169 IQ. No, he was brilliant his entire life. This is a guy who's doing mathematics. Here's a for fun. For fun, right? He's doing mathematics. He plays instruments. Uh, he he can compose. There isn't anything that he couldn't do. And rather than anybody helping him and embracing him and showing him some love and affection and, and giving him some idea of things that he could do with his life for the benefit of, of humanity, they tortured and tormented him in college as an, for an experiment. Lots of fun. So anyway, he, uh, he said, look, I don't like this world I'm living in. And in 1967, he was teaching mathematics and he stuck around, but without explanation, at the end of June in 1969, he said, screw this. And he just left. He got the hell out of that place. And there was a quote. Somebody said that he was pathologically shy. Isn't that freaking awful? Imagine this poor dude, right? Pathologically shy. That it's like, can we can we pile on any more problems onto this guy, right? At this point, so he lives with his parents for a couple of years. Let me see what I got next. So that's him, right? Good looking dude, right? Strong face, good hair. We've already established the hair. We've already established good looking dude, good hair. And 1971. He gets a remote cabin outside Lincoln, Montana, wherever the hell that is. I'm sure it's lovely. And here's the description of the cabin, by the way. It had a bed. It had two chairs. It had storage trunks. It had a gas stove. And it had lots of books. He just wanted a simple life, right? He didn't care about having a lot of money. Didn't care about having electricity or running water. And he figured, well, just, you know, I'll work some odd jobs here and there. And, and his family, you know, supported him a little bit as well. Now, some people probably think this sounds crazy, right? You probably think, my God, that's uh, insane, right? But is it? Is it insane? I mean, how many of you were like me that all you want, not, it's not all you want in life. But one of you, one of the main things you want in life is to have no emails in your inbox, right? How many times have you sat down in front of your email and you're like, I just, I just want zero. I just want none. Let me just sit here and go through my freaking emails as quick as I can. Spam, 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 spam. Oh, 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 okay, that, okay, got it. Right. And it's like, please just get me down to zero. And then you do. And you sit back and you have a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of meat or a chalice of cider or a flagon and you fill your flagon with any beverage of your choice and you sit by the campfire uh, or your fireplace. So you just sit on your sofa and you're like, Phew, thank God. And then you go to sleep. And then in the morning you check your email and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, please no more freaking emails. I can't stand. Right? It's like you finally reached a point in your life where you're not getting mail anymore, right? Like very, how often have you don't get mail? I like, I get no freaking mail. I don't want it. I don't want to look at it. Don't have any, I don't want to have, it goes to my cousin, by the way. I wouldn't even look at mail. I have a cousin that lives 10 hours from me. She gets my freaking mail because I can't, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to see it. I don't care. Don't tell me. I don't, I, I, I won the uh, whatever the hell that thing is award, right? With the stamps, whatever the hell that thing's called. I, I don't just leave me alone. And now it's like, okay, well, I got no mail. It's kind of like sex lies and videotape. You ever see sex lies and videotape? And they're like, why don't you have a car? He's like, well, because I don't want to carry any keys. And she's like, what do you mean you want to carry keys? He goes, look, I, ha I have an apartment that's one key. All right. And then I get a car that's two keys. And then I get an office that's three keys. Right? So before you know it, I got all these keys. And it's like, I don't want keys. Right. And so Ted Kaczynski wanted to be freaking left alone and read his books. Is that so bad? Is that so bad? Don't tell me you don't want that. How many of you have gone on vacation? You used to go on vacation. You're like, oh, I'll go to a big city. Oh, San Francisco sounds great. Oh, yes, Paris. Oh, I'd love to go to Paris. Wouldn't that be lovely? And then you reach a point, you're like, you know what? I would like to just go to the Bahamas. 
I just want to sit on the beach and drink from a coconut, right? Bring me my drink, bring me my pina colada and leave me the hell alone. My damn sand, my toes in the sand. Toss up my heart and see where it lands. <laughs> you know that song, right? Down in Jamaica, they got lots of pretty women. Steal your money and they'll break your hearts. What song is that? Anybody know what song that is? That's a good song. Uh, but anyway, so this guy just wants to be left alone. And he wants to read. He wants to... Uh, and, and by the way, and he wants time to read. And by the way, let me just say this. This is, uh, I, don't, I don't make many Jack Kerouac references, do I? But Jack Kerouac, anybody know who Jack Kerouac was? On the road, right? Beat writer. And so this was a brilliant dude. He actually went to Columbia University, right? This was a blue collar dude, but he was brilliant. He went to Columbia. That's, uh, for those who don't know, Columbia's Ivy League. It's um, Northern Manhattan. But either way, he used to do uh, just jo crappy uh, jobs. He just did, um, you know, blue collar. And he wasn't the only one. Throughout history, Henry Miller, you've got all kinds of great writers. And what they would do is they would do mindless work because they were so freaking smart. They didn't want to take their jobs home with them, right? They didn't want to take their jobs home. And so they would do whatever they had to do, go to work, earn their paycheck, they had to now have enough money to pay their rent, go out with their friends, go buy some beer, whatever it is. And they didn't have to think about it, right? You know why there's so much depression in a lot of profet First of all, you guys know you've been lied to about going to college. Listen, I went to college. You don't have to be a freaking genius to go to college, right? And in the United States, at least, they bang this into your head. Go to college, go to college, go to college, go to college. And you don't learn jack, okay? You don't really learn anything, especially now that you couldn't learn on your own right? And they beat this into your mind that you should be white collar, white collar, white collar. And then you're going to be cool become white collar and they're miserable. They're freaking miserable. I have five lawyers in my family. They're the worst human beings the world has ever known. They're dumb. They're evil. They're bad people, right? But And, and you have all this depression with lawyers because it's like you can't just leave your job. You can't just like, at, I'm sorry, at like five o'clock. All right, see ya. Uh, good night. Then you got homework, you know, you got to read stuff and you're dragging home your life with you. And you've got this, this misery, this poison stirring inside of you all the time. And so when I read stuff like this about Ted Kaczynski, and I'm not trying to show him in a positive light, I'm trying to compare him to other geniuses throughout history who simply are like, leave me the hell of hell alone <laughs> you know, with, with being a mathematics professor, with doing that. You know what it is? It's like that movie. What the hell was that movie we were talking about? The uh, How do you like them apples? What was that called? Uh, hunting, hunting somebody, hunting the man, hunting the dog, hunting something. And it's like, what did he want? He's like, screw this. <laughs> I don't want to be a professor. Leave me the hell alone. Let me go work at a bagel shop or whatever the hell he would have done. And so you see stuff like that. And the reason I'm talking about this is... You know, I don't like when I read about this guy, some weirdo, right? Because he wants uh, he wants to live a quiet life and he just wants to read and do different things. Now, on one hand, it sounds kind of hypocritical of me, doesn't it? Because I was saying earlier, hey, listen, why don't we get something out of the dude? We've got him in prison, uh, you know, and he's sitting there. Well, yeah, when he had a choice, when he had a freaking choice, he chose to be the hell left alone. But now sitting in a cell and, you know, and being able to go out and ride a bike and, and go to the stream and go hiking. But he doesn't have that anymore. Now he's 23 hours in a cell. Why not at least approach the guy? Maybe it did happen. We don't know. And said, listen, you know, we can get you out of this freaking cell, but here's what we need in return. You know, why don't you here, here's a mathematical problem that's been, that people are trying to solve and they can't figure it out. Or here's some astronomical something or other. And, you know, here's this thing. Can you be part of this think tank? And can you can you contribute in that way? And in return, you know, you can go into the, the library or you could be out for three hours a day instead of one. And, you know, it's like, well, what can we negotiate here? Right. What can we get out of this brilliant guy? Right. You know, schizophrenic, whatever the hell it is. I don't, we don't know who the hell knows. Right. Could have been a legal strategy or, or not or not. Goodwill hunting. Exactly. So 
hunting the apple. That's what it's called. Wait, did I say that? I didn't mean to. Uh, so anyway, this guy, so he, listen, he wants to live without electricity, without running water. He wasn't the only one. We see this throughout history. Look at Van Gogh. Didn't we just talk about Van Gogh? And Van Gogh, just like, look, let me go live in Arles. Notice I didn't add the S, Arles. He wanted to go live in Arles in this quiet little place. He wanted other, um, he wanted other artists to kind of hang out and, and talk and find other people that he could relate to and talk to and be friends with. And he was looking for this quiet kind of life. And don't, and listen, some of you want the same damn thing. You want a quiet life. You don't, you're tired of the freaking email thing. You're tired of it. How many freaking times? That's why I don't go on TikTok. I don't, I barely know what it is. I don't want to know, but I go on Instagram and it's like, if I have to see one more 23 year old girl changing her outfit, what is that? This is, this is what you do. Let me change my outfit and put a video up on Instagram. That don't make my grandparents proud of me. Anyway, he had an old bicycle going in and out of town, went to the library. Um, he read classic works and their original languages, right? So this smart dude. So 1978, uh, he's just angry at the world and he starts hand delivering a series of bombs. This is how he was living, by the way. And I don't want to beat up on it. It's like, well, you know, it's a freaking shed. What do you want it to look like? Well, you, you want him to go to Ikea? I mean, by the way, let's be honest. If Ikea would have uh, started selling like their, old, their own Unabomber kit, right? And by that, I mean like a, a nice... Uh, the Ikea cabin, the Unabomber kit. Can, you, can I be... Listen, I've been in an Ikea. You know how they do that? They like create these like little rooms and you're like, wow, I could live in a 400 square foot space. Look at all the shelving. This is fantastic. And an actual size kitchen. They're not cutting corners on the kitchen. I could actually live in a 400 square foot space and have a full size refrigerator. Yeah, I can go for this. Right. So at, actually at this point, before we go any further, why don't I show you that FBI website? Let's do that. Do I have it? Do I have it? I thought I had it. Um, maybe I don't. Wait, yes, I do. Wait, hold on. Okay. We'll watch this. FBI, if you're listening, don't copyright strike me. I will tell everybody. I'll tell the whole freaking world that the FBI gave me a copyright strike for playing a damn video. You don't want that. Trust me, FBI, you don't want any heat from me in the Strange History Club. Don't get on our bad side, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, man. If you guys never hear from me ever again, just joking. All right, here we go. I don't know if there's any audio. Yeah, there is. Okay. I don't know what audio there would be. Let's watch this together. Let us enjoy. I will even turn my mic. I turn my mic off to tell you that I'm turning my mic off. I'm turning my mic off. Give me a second, you guys. Hang tight. Okay, if there's anybody listening who has any relationship with anybody at Ikea, don't tell me this isn't the marketing opportunity of a lifetime, right? Think about it. This guy lived for years, right? If it's good enough for the Unabomber, it should be good enough for anybody else, right? So a smart dude went to Harvard, right? Professor, <laughs> there's no reason. Think about how they could market it. Have your own Unabomber. Ikea could sell a zillion of these. They could sell the entire cabin, fully furnished, refrigerator, the whole shebang. So those are my thoughts. Hey, Kathy, I don't know if I saw this or not yet. So thank you very much for the time travel tokens. They are much appreciated. 
Happy to have you here, Kathy. So what do you guys think? And and by the way, I don't know how it works. I don't know if Ted Kaczynski could get a percentage, like 10%. Like, could he work out a deal with Ikea and say, look, 10% and I will design it for you. Each one comes with its own copy of the manifesto. Who knows? All right, let's talk about his bombings, shall we? So what's that? Uh, bombings. Okay. That's uh, an unattractive slide, isn't it? I'll leave it with that. And then I, I will read for you. Give me a second. I've got, I've got the information here on his bombings. And I will read that. Well, let me tell you first. So 1978, that's when he started hand delivering or mailing his bombs, right? And that's pretty ballsy. The hand delivery thing, wouldn't you say? I didn't. I actually didn't know that until today, that he did that, that he hand delivered them, and many of them contained initials, FC, and people like you know FBI is like, what the hell does FC stand for? What does that mean? It stood for Freedom Club, Freedom Freedom Club FC, and that was inscribed on parts inside. And it's interesting because he didn't have to do that. He was kind of creating, um, you know what red herrings are, right? Like a, a false diversionary clue. And so he just pretty much created this thing, FC, just to kind of mess around with the FBI and be like, hey, you know, FC, gee, what's that? You know, you have a whole task force trying to figure out what the hell FC stands for. And he did some other things also. He put misleading clues in there. And I think he did things like he would put branches in there, leaves, right? So he had some little naturey type thing that he would put in there. He was very careful not to leave any fingerprints. So in 1979, a bomb was placed, and this is pretty disgusting. All right, my, my sympathy for him ends once the bombings start, by the way. So here's what this guy did. This is disgusting. He put a, a bomb was placed in the cargo hold of American Airlines Flight 444. That was a Boeing 727. It was flying from Chicago to Washington, D.C. Think about how freaking awful that is. How awful is that? A bomb was put in an airplane, right? It had a faulty timing mechanism, thank goodness, that kept it from exploding. The thing is, it released a hell of a lot of freaking smoke. And the pilots are like, oh my God, what the hell is going on? And so they made an emergency landing. And then the authorities are checking it out. It's like, whoa, 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 there's a freaking bomb in here. It had enough power to obliterate the airplane. Isn't that crazy? Can you get a different picture? Yeah, I guess. How about that? I'm talking about his bomb, so you got that. And then, so that's awful. And then he sent the next bomb to the president of United Airlines. The guy's name was Percy Wood. And he opened it up, I guess, and uh, he got cuts and burns over most of his body. Let's see the plane. I don't have a picture of that. I don't have a picture. So then he uh, he put more false clues in the bombs. Smart dude. You know, I don't know how to build a bomb. And I have a copy of the, uh, I shouldn't say. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. I had to do this, build something like that. Uh, clue, I mean, right? I mean, I, what the hell's involved with this stuff? You got batteries. You got all kinds of crazy things. Whenever I see movies about people... <laughs> taking apart bombs like geez these people have freaking balls of steel how the hell do you do that i don't even know if people do that anymore do they they just have those um those kind of little golf carty things that go over there and pick them up and and then they just blow it up inside of itself right is bum which is probably which is great right god knows how many lives things like that save so what else uh he sent um the fbi figured well, okay, there's a theme here because you've got nature and trees and wood. He's putting little pieces of, of that stuff in the, there, little uh, like bark tree branches in there. And they're like, okay, well, there's some kind of theme here. The guy has an obsession with wood, right? He's got some kind of obsession. What could that, what could that be? So I'm going to jump to 1983 in a second because that was a big turning point. 
But let me just tell you about some of his bombs that they know of, right? So 1978 and 79, he sent two bombs to Northwestern University. And then 1979, later that year, was American Airlines Flight 444. Uh, let's see. It says there were 12 passengers that were victims. I wonder what that means. Probably because of the smoke, right? Because there had to have been more than 12. There had to have been 12, more than 12 passengers on that plane. And then June 10th of 1980, he sent a bomb to the president of United Airlines. That guy got severe cuts and burns over most of his body and face. And then 1981, he sent a bomb to the University of Utah. That bomb was diffused. And then a couple a year later, 82. So he was busy. He's pumping these out. But hey, well, he's busy, but he's not busy. I mean, what's he doing? Like uh, one in 78, two in 79, one in 80, one in 81. He did a couple in 82. He sent one to Vanderbilt University. And uh, the university secretary, she got severe burns on her hands. And she got shrapnel wounds to her body. And then in 82 and 85, he sent two to the University of California at Berkeley. One was to an engineering professor whose name I can't pronounce. I almost want to try it because it's so freaking weird. D uh, God. Diagonis Angelakos. Okay. Uh, he didn't kill him, by the way. Severe burns and shrapnel wounds. And then a guy named John Hauser was a graduate student, and he had a loss of four fingers and severed artery in his right arm and partial loss of vision in his left eye. So that sucks, poor dude. And then, let me go back, 19, all right, so 1983, here's what was going on. What did he have against the airlines? I don't know, it's a good question. Where did he get the money for this? Well, he was using junk. He was using stuff that really... I think that's the problem with the Postal Service couldn't even really figure out whether, I mean, they, they couldn't even do anything about it. It's like, well, where the hell is he getting this from? You know, it's not like it's coming from a specific place, like, you know, where they could do something about it. So that was a that was a big problem also. He was smart enough to just put together bombs with junk. So in his first interview after his arrest, he said that, he was on a hike in one of his favorite spots. And I'm going to read a quote. This is what he said. This is, this is Ted. This is what Ted said. It's kind of rolling country, not flat. And when you get to the edge of it, you find these ravines that cut very steeply into cliff-like drop-offs. And there was even a waterfall there. It was about a two days hike from my cabin. That was the best spot until the summer of 1983. That summer, there were too many people around my cabin. So I decided I, need, I needed some space. I went back to the plateau. And when I got there, I found they had put a road right through the middle of it. You just can't imagine how upset I was. It was from that point on, I decided that rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills. I would work on getting back at the system. Revenge. So he's pissed off about a road being built in this area that, um, you know, that he loved. And instead of trying to do something positive about this, he decided to get revenge by killing a bunch of strangers doesn't make any sense to me, right? doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like, uh, God, we could talk about this all day long. Has, has anybody heard of a singer? He was very, very famous in the 70s, I guess 80s also. His name was John Denver. Anybody ever hear of him? It wasn't his real name. I can't pronounce his real name. He was German something, you know, Glucken, Glocken, luckily Heimer or something. But uh, John Denver. He wasn't too thrilled about stuff like this, right? I mean, has anybody ever heard of a song that he sang? It's a very esoteric song. Many of you may not have heard of it. Very rare. 
very, very difficult to hear. Many of you, don't be embarrassed if you've never heard of this John Denver song. Uh, it was called Rocky Mountain High. Anybody ever hear that song? Very rare. Almost nobody's ever heard of it. Me and maybe a few other people. Uh, but anyway, he had this great, great song. And so what he said in there was, um, he, he said something about, let me see if I could find it. He said something about scars across the land, wasn't it? Isn't that what it was? He was talking, oh, here it is, okay. So he's talking about himself, really, right, in this song. And he says, uh, now his life is full of wonder, but his heart still knows some fear of simple things he cannot comprehend. While they try to tear the mountains down to bring in a couple more, more people, more scars upon the land. Right. So here's John Denver, who's a great environmentalist, great environmentalist, right? Love nature, sang about Colorado, sang about, you know, West Virginia, all sorts of beautiful places. But he didn't go around doing horrible things. He didn't go around and start killing people. He's like, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write songs. I'm going to write songs that people are going to want to listen to. Right. And so I'll be able to have my impact by being a positive force. Right. And that's what John Denver was. By all accounts, this guy was a positive force in his life. Nothing but beauty, John Denver left behind, right? Incredible life. And so Ted Kaczynski is this brilliant guy, and he could have made any decision he wanted. And with his great, great brain, right? Incredible. The best thing he could think of to do was to kill complete strangers and destroy their lives. So it's frustrating, right? Now, once again, we could say, well, geez, you know, they created this monster, didn't they? Right? But who knows? Uh, so anyway, in 19... So so that's what really... that re Now, the thing is, it wasn't just that, though, because that was 1983. And at that point, he had already been sending out bombs since 78. So what's that? Four or five years already, right? But anyway, just something to consider about how this is a route that he chose, right? He wasn't forced to do this. Oh, some of you have heard of John Denver. I'm very glad. I thought I was like the only one. Has anybody heard that song? You've heard that song before? Rocky Mountain High? You guys are so freaking smart. You really are. You're the smartest crowd. You know how I know that you're smart? Because you're not watching some other shows right now where they're talking about the news or Gwyneth Paltrow, oh my God, oh, she's on trial. Oh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Who cares? Uh, John Denver, uh, Henry John Deutschendorf, 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 Deutschendorf. Oh, that's easy, Deutschendorf, Deutschendorf. Uh, you got to be honest though, Henry Deutschendorf is hardly the name of a great pop singer. So yeah, John Denver chose the name Denver, didn't he? From Denver, Colorado. So there's that. You're singing it in your head right now. It's a great song. Everything John Denver did. And you know what I like is uh, Thirsty Boots. You guys know that song, Thirsty Boots? Actually, I don't even know if Thirsty Boots was his song. I think he sang it, but I don't know if that, I don't know if he wrote that, but everything he wrote was great. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, like I said, Ted Kaczynski could have gone that route, but he didn't. He went another way, brother, as the judge said to Ted Bundy after he was done trying to defend himself. Well, he did defend himself, just failed. In 1993, after a six-year break, Kaczynski mailed a bomb to the home of Charles Epstein from the University of California in San Francisco. Epstein lost several fingers upon opening the package, and in the same weekend, Kaczynski mailed a bomb to David Galertner, who was a computer science professor at Yale University. Geldner's poor dude, poor dude, lost sight in one eye. He lost hearing in one ear, and he lost a portion of his right hand. I don't get it. I just don't. I don't get it. You know, what are you doing this for? What do you guys think? You guys could start talking about it early if you want. What the hell was wrong with him? I mean, is this, how much of this do we attribute to the way he was raised, I, you know, and the way he was 
How much do we attribute this to the way he was molded, the way he was created, to the torment that he went through? How much do we attribute that to? Because we don't, listen, what, what do we say about him? Okay, so he's shy. Great. Shy people don't do this, right? Is he schizophrenic? Don't know. How does it, does anybody know who's schizophrenic? Can somebody who's schizophrenic put together the manifesto that he did, which is enormous. We're going to, I'm trying to get to it as quick as I can. And, and the incredible writings that he did, right? And the uh, dissertations and the rest of it. So how much of this was the creation the attempt or, you know, the creation of somebody like this? Or is he just a, a psychopath, right? Or is he, or, or a little bit of everything? Nature versus nurture, yeah. So in 1994, another executive was killed. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, Burstyn Mart Seller. What the hell is that? That's a company, I guess. Anybody know what that is? Burstyn Mart Teller. What the hell is that? I don't even know what that is. Anybody know what that is? Anybody hear that before? Let's see what that is. Burst, Burson Marsteller is a global communications agency. Who cares? That's your best, that's your description of your company? Burson Conan Wolf, I guess that's what it's called now, is a multinational public relations and communications firm. That that's you you can't hire somebody to write a sentence that can more uh interestingly and concisely describe your company. Nobody knows what that means. Multinational public relations and communications firm. Good God. Many schizophrenics are geniuses. Yeah. Yeah, it was already antisocial. They did, they made him worse. Let's put it that way. Right. Yeah. All right. So this guy opened, this guy was killed. Poor dude. Uh, Thomas Mosser. I think it's his name. It's, uh, oh, Moser. He was killed after opening a, a, a mail bomb sent to his home in New Jersey. And then in a letter to the New York Times, Kaczynski wrote that he had sent the bomb because of Moser's work repairing the public image of Exxon after the Exxon Valdez, Valdez or Valdez? Exxon Valdez? Oil spill. Well, I don't, well, listen, Ted, if you're listening, I don't think he did a very good job repairing the image of Exxon after that. I think people still think Exxon sucks, but okay. I don't think so, Ted, but all right. Uh, anyway, in 1995, he murdered Gilbert Brent Murray, president of the Tim Timber Industry Lobbying Group, uh, California Forestry Association, by a mail bomb. So that sucks. And then, yeah, he just kept on doing this. So there's a whole bunch. I'm going to get to his manifesto in a second, you guys. But yeah, it's it looks like... Um, where do we leave off? University of California, Berkeley, the Boeing Company, University of Michigan, Sacramento, Salt Lake City, Tiburon, Yale University. Boy, he really went after a lot of universities. Wow. North Caldwell and Sacramento. You know what? I'm not going to say this. Should I say this? I hate to say this. You know, You know, a lot of universities do really disgusting things to, to primates, to primates who are, who, are, who are very smart, right? Very smart. Imagine you're an orangutan and you spend your entire life in a cage the size of a refrigerator. Imagine that. They live as long as us. Imagine being 50 years old. And you're an orangutan and your entire life was spent in a, in a cage the size of a refrigerator. Imagine the things that these universities do to beagles who are very docile, right? All these horrible things. And you would think Ted Kaczynski with his genius, forget the bombs, forget murdering people, forget all this other stuff. But if you're really going to do something about universities, you want to expose them, you want to stop things. Why the hell wouldn't you at least find something like that and say, you know, when I was 15 years old, I was accepted into Harvard. When I was 25 years old, I was teaching at the University of California at Berkeley, right? I've written all these dissertations. I've won all kinds of awards. I know what I'm talking about. These universities should stop getting funding. You know, what, I'm just using this as an example. Why the hell don't you try to do something good with your time, your energy, your resources, your, your brain power 
than than killing innocent people, right? Right. So let's talk about the manifesto. Right. We're, we're getting to that. So in 1995, Kaczynski mailed several letters to media outlets. I'm actually going to change my slide here. There's Ted in front of his cabin. Not made by Ikea, by the way. And Ikea is not a sponsor of our program. Just mentioning that. OK, so he mailed letters to uh, me media outlets and he says, listen, I need you to print this. OK, it's it's thirty five thousand words. Right. There might be some typos, but don't worry about it. Just do it the way it is. And it's called Industrial Society and Its Future. And, you know, you need to publish it. And they're like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. And then uh, Janet Reno, who, uh, <sighs> Janet Reno, FBI Director Janet Reno, another, another freaking joy to the world, uh, recommended its publication um, and she she said, well, you know, maybe if it got published, somebody will identify the author. So maybe that would be a good thing. So uh, a guy named Bob Guccione, I think is that his name? Guccione, Guccione. He owned a publication that, and I know that many of you, if not most of you, are very sheltered individuals. And I'm going to mention the name of a publication right now that I am positive I'm, uh, well, I can't be positive. I'm almost positive that most of you have never heard ever in your entire life of a publication called Penthouse. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's called Penthouse. Um, it's not a real estate um, magazine. It's not about people living in penthouses, just to give you an idea. Um, it's not. It's not about designing penthouses. It's not, it's not a publication for interior designers. It's more about exterior design, let's say rather than interior. But either way, uh, Bob says, listen, I'll publish it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. That'll be great. Yeah, that'll be fine. Um, but yes, there will be images, but leave those up to us. We'll take care of the images. And Ted Kaczynski found out. And he said, ah, okay, let's see. Penthouse, penthouse. I think I've heard of that. Okay. Well, it's less respectable the New York Times and the Washington Post. <laughs> Wait, hold, hold on a second. This is 1995, okay? Today in 2023, let's be honest, Penthouse is more respectable than the New York Times and the Washington Post. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Penthouse at the time, Ted thought it was less respectable. So he said, okay, fine. Um, if, t if Penthouse wants to publish it, that's fine with me. However, I'm going to reserve the right to plant one and only one bomb intended to kill after the manuscript has been published if Penthouse ends up being the only one. Okay, now if somebody else publishes it, fine. Okay, somebody else publishes it, don't worry. But if Penthouse is the only one that agrees and nobody else does it, I reserve the right to send out another bomb and kill somebody. If somebody else agrees, then I won't. So it seems like a good deal, doesn't it? So. What do you think happened? The Washington Post, who uh, today is less credible than Penthouse, uh, published the essay on September 19th of 1995. And that was that. It was up and running. And it was out there for the whole world to read. And we're going to read some of it in a second. Marketing brain? What, Penthouse? Oh, yeah. Freaking brilliant for Penthouse. I... I don't think, what year is this, 95? 95, the, was the internet even around yet? I don't even know. Probably not, right? Not really getting started. But either way, I'm pretty sure Penthouse had a pretty good circulation at the time. But this would have really been something. So what happened? Uh, it gets published. And let's see. Uh, yeah, it gets published. I'll tell you a little bit. I'll give you a little summary of it. I got some information here, summary. So 35,000 words, we already know about that. And he's arguing uh, industrialization, modern technology are destroying the natural world and dehumanizing individuals. Well, Ted, you happen to be right. <laughs> that is true. He argued that the pursuit of technological progress has led to a decline in individual freedom. Yeah, yeah, Ted, Ted right about that too. 
And he said that people will become increasingly isolated and powerless. Yep, 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 without a doubt, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, so he said that technology was destabilizing effect. It was having a destabilizing effect in the world and that people were feeling unfulfilled and it was causing some widespread psychological suffering. Yeah, yeah, you got that. Said people were spending too much time engaged in useless pursuits. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, probably. I mean, do you guys remember last May? You, If you went on Twitter for, you went on Twitter for five minutes, it was 9,000 tweets about Amber Heard. And you're like, you have nothing else to talk about? In the whole freaking world, you have nothing else to talk about except Johnny Depp's ex-wife? Seriously? And then you'd see people's Twitter feeds, and it was all through the freaking day. It was in the morning, in the afternoon. It was at night. There was a lady that I was friendly with. I had to stop talking to her because I would look at her tweets or whatever the hell it's called, Twitter feed, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon, over and over and over again, all day long about Johnny Depp's ex-wife being the most evil person in the world. Now, we already knew it. We already know she is. But why the hell don't you have anything to do? Go out and get some freaking fresh air. Take off your damn shoes. They must have grass in Australia or wherever the hell she is. Walk in the freaking grass, lady. Go climb a tree. Do something. But your whole life can't be being on Twitter, bitching about Johnny Depp's ex-wife. There's got to be more to life. And if it wasn't for, you know, this uh, technology and Twitter, whatever. And, and look, there's good things too. Um, not like there isn't. We, all, we already know there is. Like, you know, hey, this show, right? Um, and then, so there was that. And so he was just kind of like, look, there's all these things that are, it was interesting. It's because it's this think tank stuff, right? And it's predicting the future. The problem is, and I haven't read it in a long time, but in life, you want to have solutions to stuff. You can't just say, well, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. You want to be able to say, well, okay, here's a problem, and here's something you can do about it, right? If you've never been mellow. Uh, what's her name? The Grease Chick. Olivia Newton-John. I never understood that song. Have you never been mellow? Who's going to say that to a guy? What kind of man was, was Olivia Newton-John appealing to? At the time, and she's asking some guy that in like what 1978, 79, when men had hair on their chest. I don't know if men have hair on their chest anymore, do they? Um, but anyway, then he started doing political type stuff, Ted. And he said that this is a quote uh, he defined leftists as mainly socialists, collectivists, politically correct types, feminists, gay, and disability activists animal rights activists, hey, I take that personally, and the like. Um, he believes that over-socialization and feelings of inferiority are primary drivers of leftism and derides it as, and this is a quote, one of the most widespread manifestations of the craziness of our world. Isn't that incredible? He wrote this in the 90s, right? Actually, who knows when he wrote it? It just happened to have been, that's when it was published. I mean, this thing's enormous, so he probably been working on it for a pretty long time. Um, he adds that the type of movement he envisions must be anti-leftist and refrain from collaboration with leftists, as in his view, and this is a quote, leftism is in the long run inconsistent, leftism is in the long run inconsistent with wild nature, with human freedom, and with the elimination of modern technology. Now, by the way, just in case you think, well, he's, you know, MAGA. Yeah. He also criticized conservatives. He described them as, and this is a quote, fools who whine about the decay of traditional values, yet uh, da, 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 enthusiastically support technological progress and economic growth, things that he argues have led to the decay. So he wasn't choosing one political side over the other. He's pissed off about all kinds of stuff. Uh, so anyway, the FBI gets involved. They've been involved for a long time. They called it Unibomb, as we mentioned earlier, University and Airline Bomber. And so 
1979, they put together a task force of 125 agents from the FBI, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, that would be the ATF, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Ooh, I'm sure their contribution was, uh, was stellar. Uh, but anyway, they eventually had more than 150 full-time personnel, and they started trying to analyze the recovered components of the bombs. They're trying to figure out, okay, is there any connection between the people? Do they all know the same person? You know, what's going on here? And they're just trying to figure stuff out. So in 1980, there was a psychological profile and that the FBI did. And let's see what they came up with. They said the Unabomber had above average intelligence and connections to academia. Ooh, FBI really earning their money. That's pretty brilliant, you guys. FBI guys listening right now, let me tell you something. That's pretty good stuff there. Hold on a second. Above average intelligence and connections to academia. Whoo, that's genius stuff there. That's Ted Kaczynski level brilliance to come up with that one. But then to show you that they didn't uh, limit their brilliance to just that one, they also came up with another profile. And they said he was a blue collar airplane mechanic, blue collar airplane mechanic. Oh boy, our tax dollars at work. Hey, Brandy. Thank you very much for the time travel token, reminding me that it's 10 o'clock and I better freaking speed things up. I'm doing my best. Thank you though. I appreciate it. Like always, what would we do without Brandy? Anybody? Anybody want to tell me? I don't know. Without the great Brandy, without the great Linda, without the great Cat Ninja, we would be spiraling down into a horrible abyss as we speak. So the FBI, what do you guys think about either one of those? Would you say that if you were working at the FBI at the time, would you say, hmm, above average intelligence? Or would you say blue collar airplane mechanic? <laughs> this, is, this is where they're going. Right. And so you probably like half of them like damn straight freaking blue collar airplane mechanic. And the other half like no above average intelligence. By the way, how insulting is that to blue collar airplane mechanics? So so a blue collar airplane mechanic is not above average intelligence. Let me tell you guys this. OK, and, and I think you can agree with me. I hope more than anything in the world that every single blue collar airplane mechanic is above average intelligence. Please let that be the case. Please, 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 airlines, listen to me. Do not hire your blue collar airplane mechanics because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or because of uh, what they, they think they're a, a, a caterpillar. Nothing like that. Please, for the love of God, please, 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 do not hire your blue collar airplane mechanics based on some freaking checklist of things like, well, you know, we could use some more of these in our, or no, please, 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 please let them be above average intelligence. Okay. I don't ask for much, please. I don't, just because they're a lesbian, just because they're, they were Native American, just because they have orange hair and they have a, a, a ring through their vagina and in their nose, um, and they, they think that they're a butterfly, give them a job somewhere else. Keep them away from the planes. Keep them away. I'm just, no, no, listen, I'm not being judgmental. Give them a job. Please give them a job. Somewhere else. Please. The Unibomb Task Force set up a toll-free telephone hotline to take calls relating to the investigation with a $1 million reward for anyone who could provide some information leading to his capture. So here's where things kind of get interesting. You ready, you guys? Ted Kaczynski. Remember he had a brother? You guys remember that? He had a brother? David. And his wife is like, you know, this kind of sounds like Ted. And David's like, what? And his wife's like, yeah. Kind of reminds me of Ted. I wonder if that's Ted. I think Ted's the Unabomber. And David's like, nah, really? You think? And she's like, 
remember those letters he used to send to you in the 70s? And he's like, yeah. We still got them up in the attic, right? And he's like, yeah. Go grab them. Because there's some things that he said in there that it looks like was said in the manifesto. And so let's see if we can compare them. And so David's like going through some papers, right? Some letters from the 70s. And he's like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> this kind of sounds like my brother. And that's what happened. Now, here's the thing. The FBI is getting a zillion leads. They're getting a zillion phone calls. People are claiming that uh, they're the Unabomber. Or their cousin is. They're, you know, Everybody's the freaking Unabomber. And it's like, how the hell? Are you going to get to the FBI? Because even if you know who the Unabomber is, what are you going to do? It's like um, Beatles reference number three or four. When John Lennon said he saw an, uh, a UFO over New York and some journalist is like, well, why don't you, did you call the police? He's like, no, what? What am I going to do? Call the police and say, hi, this is John Lennon. I just saw a UFO flying over the East River. It's like, they're not going to pay attention. And so even if you know who the Unabomber is, how the hell do you call the FBI? Because it'll just get put at the bottom of a pile. And it's like, okay, another lead to follow. Because you can't say, no, 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 no. Listen, this time we really know. We know who it is. This is the guy. The FBI hear, heard that five gazillion freaking times. And they're working hard enough, right? Hundred was it? 125 up to 150 people. And they, it's a lot of freaking work. And they're following up on every lead right? Or, you know, every reasonable lead. So it's like, what the hell do you do? And so David, this is what he did, which is, I, I it wouldn't even occur to me to do something like this, but it's pretty smart. So he hired an attorney in Washington, D.C. Uh, his name was Tony Biskegli or something like that. And he's like, listen, gather all this evidence together and you contact the FBI. You're a lawyer. They'll, you know, pay more attention to you maybe. And so he's like, all right. And also, David was trying to stay uh, anonymous. So he figured, all right, well, you know, I'll have a lawyer do it. Leave me the hell out of this nightmare. Because I don't want my brother. I don't want the Unabomber finding out anything. And and so, look, they're trying to protect their name, but you can't do it. The FBI, they probably, and by the way, this is not a bad thing about the FBI. I mean, they probably just said, look, this lawyer's communicating with somebody. It could be, for all we know, it could be the Unabomber himself. Right. And he's trying to pin it on somebody else. So they probably who the hell knows wired his phones or whatever the hell they did. And so they found that it was him. What can you do? And and they had it. They, they started analyzing the letters and the manifesto. And there was some analyst from the FBI. And he's like, there's more than a 60 percent chance that the same person who wrote these letters wrote this manifesto. And so. That dude, the analyst, gave a copy of this essay that Ted Kaczynski wrote in 1971 to a lady named Molly Flynn at the FBI. <laughs> oh, you know what I just remembered, you guys? Uh, yesterday, I apologize, the Great Brandy gave five memberships yesterday. Nice, fresh, hot, uh, out-of-the-oven memberships. So... Thank you very much, Brandy, for doing that. And I see that the great Linda and the great Brandy and the great Chris Mullen all gave memberships today to our fellow strange historians. So for all of those who have been fortunate enough to get memberships that were gifted by the great Linda, the great Brandy and the great Chris, you are so fortunate. You have no idea. They will last for 30 days and you will enjoy all of the wonders of being a member believe me it's uh, so exciting you'll be barely be able to contain yourself uh you'll wake up every morning and you'll say my god i cannot believe i'm a member of the strange history society this is great i never knew the what was missing from my life i knew there was something out there that i needed to make me whole i didn't know what it was though what could it be? Could it be emeralds and jewels and diamonds? Could it be a pearl necklace? Could it be a lifetime supply of scones? Could it be a flagon filled with a beverage of my choice? Could it be meeting a tall, handsome stranger? Could it be meeting a small, uh, pale stranger? 
Who knows? But then you get a membership from Linda or Brandy or Chris. And now you know what it would take to make your life whole, to bring you, to give you the enjoyment, the, to, to have your dream come true. You could now, and I don't wish death upon anybody, but when the day comes, when you are in your final moments and you're looking up toward the sky, you say to yourself, I was, and you're, you're, you're kind of choked up, I was a member of the Strange History Society. Yes, I was. And you turn to the people you love and you say, put that on my Put that on my gravestone, please. I was a member of the Strange History Society and I will see all my strange historians in another world and we will continue our study group in the sky. And this is because this has happened, all of you who, who have your own memberships, who took it upon yourself to get your own membership. But for those who, for whatever reason, just didn't get around to do it, and then the great Linda, the great Brandy, and the great Chris gifted one upon you. And it is like a gift from the gods. It is like Athena, right? It is like the gods and goddesses from Mount Olympus giving you a hero on a hero's journey, uh, a sword to fight Medusa. Because you can't look Medusa in the eyes, right? They're giving you this great, you're like Perseus on a journey. And this is what the membership has done for you. So congratulations, everybody. Congratulations for all of you. 15 fortunate people tonight got yourself a nice, fresh, hot out of the oven, delicious. It's like a cookie. It's like the most delicious cookie you could ever possibly imagine. And now 15 of you now have a nice, warm, delicious cookie. By the way, if your warm, delicious cookie has chocolate in it, do not, do not, you could take this advice if you want, don't eat it near your sofa. Don't do it. What will happen, you'll, you won't, you'll forget about it. You'll have chocolate on your fingers, and then you're going to get smears of chocolate on your sofa. You're never going to get it out. You're never going to get it out. Okay? So eat your cookies, chocolate, melted, delicious chocolate chunk cookies. Eat them on the floor, standing up somewhere, nowhere near your sofa. That seem reasonable? All right, I'm going to end this um, poll. So 33% of you know a lot and 57% know not much. And 9% of you are here for the tea and scones. So yes, I hope you enjoy the tea and scones. There are more. Is that my way of lasting longer, Scott? Uh, no, my way of lasting longer is actually to do mathematical problems in my mind, if you must know. Wait a minute, what are we talking about? Uh, by the way, that works. Uh, in case anybody's wondering. All right. Uh, asked Ted Kaczynski. I learned it from him. Where did we leave off? Where did we leave? Oh, David. So David gives these letters to the FBI, the FBI, FBI and the essays and all kinds of other stuff. And the FBI is like, huh, pretty sure this is him. And David liked his brother. He's like, yeah, man, my brother's cool, but, you know, he's killing people. And imagine being in that circumstance. Has anybody been in a situation like that? It's pretty bad, right? It's kind of like being in a situation with a, um, what do they call it? You know, when somebody's an alcoholic or a drug addict, an intervention. Has anybody ever been in an intervention? And you know the person's going to be angry as hell at you, right? Or not. I don't even know how that works, right? Uh, if there's enough people around you, I guess it softens it, right? Because it's like, no, we, we care about you. That's why we're here. You know, don't be pissed off. But something like this it's like some it's uh he knows what's going to happen he knows what's going to happen and he couldn't even say anything he can't even say anything to his brother because then you're going down with the ship right i mean think about that choice imagine having to make a choice like that in your life well i mean well some of you have right i mean sometimes in life you have to walk away from a relationship, you have to, whatever the relationship is, a friendship, a business relationship, a partnership of some sort, sometimes you have no choice but to walk away because if you don't, you're going to go down with that ship. And so self-preservation is kind of has value too, right? And it's nobody's damn business in life 
why you walk away from a relationship. You don't walk away from a relationship so people can pat you on the back and say, oh, aren't you a good person? You walked away from a bad person. No, you do it for yourself and you do it for an ultimate good. And so David put himself in the situation that what was he supposed to do? He couldn't call his brother and say, hey, Ted, are you the Unabomber? Because that's a problem, right? You can't do that. Who knows how his brother would react to it? And he can't say, listen, you need to be more careful, dude. You're going to get in a hell of a lot of trouble because he doesn't know what point, how much the FBI knows. It's not like he could call him anyway. It's not like Ted had a phone. And so what's he supposed to do? Fly to uh, wherever the hell you fly to. Montana, I'm assuming, has an airport. And then drive there and to the to the cabin and say, uh, look, the FBI is going to be hot on you, man. You better do something. Go to Mexico. Do something. Uh, you know, so it's like he really put himself in a bad He put his brother he put his brother in a very, very bad situation, right? How did he not know? How did he not know that his brother would figure it out? Don't you? What do you guys think about that? I mean, this is a brilliant dude, a brilliant dude, and he knew. He had an incredible memory, and he had to have known that his brother and his wife would figure it out. Do you think that's... I know, you have a, I know you have an airport. I know. But what do you guys think about that? Do you think that he knew and that he was depending upon his brother to turn him in? Do you think he saw it as a betrayal, right? You think, it was, you think he saw it as a betrayal? I don't think we know, do we? Do we know how Ted felt about his brother being the one to turn him in? Did he look at it as a betrayal or did he look at it like, you know, if it was going to be somebody, I'm glad it was you. Right? You think he was arrogant? You think so? Theo and Van Gogh in reverse? Oh, did they not have a good relationship? I thought they did. I mean, or, or, or as much of a relationship as they could have. Well, you know what's interesting, actually? Let me back up. There was something I forgot to tell you guys. Something happened in 1990. I think it was 1990. Uh, can I find it here? 19. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I forgot about this, you guys. Let me let me tell you. Um, Ted Kaczynski's father was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer in 1990, and at the end of that year, on October 2nd, 1990, Ted Kaczynski's father committed suicide by shooting himself in his home. I wonder why. I mean, I don't know anything about lung cancer. I'm assuming that sucks. It's got to suck, right? But I'm also, a, well, no, this is too big of an assumption. But if you have life insurance, and who knows if he did, right? I don't know. But I'm saying if he shot himself, that's the end of his life insurance, right? But either way, so that had to have thrown Ted Kaczynski threw a loop a little bit, right? But it's not like he came from a family that was suicidal. It looks like his father did that to not have to put himself or maybe his family through whatever they would be dealing with as a result of that. But did you guys know about that? Where's mom? His mom was still alive. I, I think I remember reading that the brother and the father, uh, the brother and the mother, I believe, were the ones who pushed the idea that Ted was uh, schizophrenic and, and uh, you know, suffered from you know, paranoid schizophrenia. And they think that the reason that maybe they did that, suggested that he was mentally ill, was to save him from being executed. Because in the United States, uh, we don't, you, you can't get the death penalty if you're, um, right? If you're uh, if you're um, mentally ill, right? That's not a thing. I don't even know if he would be able. To, he wouldn't be fit to. Uh, he wouldn't be fit uh, to stand trial, actually, right? If he was uh, if he was mentally ill, even. So anyway, uh, in 1998. Uh, so anyway, so so they got they arrested him, right? And the whole world found out. I think it was CBS, right? The scumbags at CBS, where they found out about the brother somebody at the fbi leaked it that's rare oh my god a leak at the fbi never heard of such a thing 
And so CBS found out and they're like, hey, we're going to tell the whole world that Ted Kaczynski's brother turned him in. You know, there's a, a scumbag named Dan Rather. Anybody know who that low life was? That anchorman scumbag? Uh, so he's like, look, we're going to do a show. We're telling the whole freaking world that it was the brother. And the FBI director is like, look, fine, Dan. Fine, Dan. Dan, do your damn show and, and remember throwing commercials there and sell some soap to people. But uh, give us 24 hours at least. OK, we've got to at least get the search warrant taken care of by this federal judge in Montana, Montana. And Dan's like, all right, got 24 hours. And so the FBI, they did a They did a uh, internal leak investigation. Surprise. They never found out who did it. And. And so the FBI. Everybody found out that it was Ted's brother. That's, that's got to suck, right? <sighs> Does that have to happen, right? I mean, how's this guy supposed to live the rest of his life? I mean, he already had to turn in his brother, right? And hero or not, right? You can look at it any way you want. But if he wanted to be anonymous, why don't you give the guy some freaking anonymity and get off his damn back, right? But no, the news, the mainstream media, the new, the CBS News had to tell everybody who it was, right? They're all excited. Wow, people, more people will watch our show tonight than they did yesterday. La -di da Let's let's ruin let's ruin this guy's life and his wife who who uh, who didn't have to do jack shit. They didn't have to do a damn thing. They could have kept the damn mouth shut. Yeah, let's go ahead and just tell the whole world that they they did that. That's fun. So. Uh, he wasn't thrilled about people thinking that he was crazy and he fired. I think he went through a couple of lawyers and he's like, listen, they want to put him to, they want to kill him. You know, they want to execute him. And so he just decides, look, I'll plead guilty. Uh, don't kill me. And they're like, okay, fine. Cause it would cost a fortune, right. To, um, to, to put the trial on, it would be a whole, whole big thing. So, like I said, mental illness, it was probably the brother and the mom doing that so he wouldn't be able to get the death penalty. And he, and he didn't get it. And then there was, I think he changed his mind and the United States Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit said, nope, it's staying the way it is. And what happened? I think they, uh, he went off to jail. The FBI did something weird. They confiscated all of his stuff, and I guess he, the the there was restitution to Kaczynski's victims of fifteen million dollars, and the FBI was like, "Hey, we'll have an auction. We'll sell that stuff in the in the in the shed and like in the cabin," and they raised two hundred and thirty two thousand dollars. So I'm sure that all of the victims that divvied up that two hundred thirty two thousand dollars, I'm sure they were thrilled. They get told, yeah, hey, we're going to get you 15 million bucks and they get 232 grand. I mean, nowadays it would be a different story. They do a, you know, GoFundMe or whatever the hell they call them and, and give these victims money. And they would have deserved it, you know, what they, had to, what they had to deal with. So he's incarcerated. He was incarcerated at ADX Florence, which is a supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. So here's this stuff. I'm getting close to the end here, you guys. And then I'll read a bit of the manifesto. So... Early in his imprisonment, he befriended Ramsey Youssef. I don't really remember who that is. Was that the blind shake? Does anybody remember who that is? Was that the blind shake? Hold on, I'll pull it up and see. Ramsey Youssef. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he was a Pakistani convicted terrorist, one of the main perpetrators of the World Trade Center bombing. Oh, Jesus. What are you being friends with that dude for? And also friends with Timothy McVeigh, another lowlife. And they became friends. And they would discuss religion and politics. And they, they formed a, a friendship un until Timothy McVeigh was executed in 2001. But I don't understand how people be can become friends if they're, all, if, they're in, if they're in the hole, right? They're in there for 23 hours a day. When is there a chance for Ramsey, Tim, and Ted to be hanging around playing 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 checkers, or do you think it was through writing letters back and forth? I think I think Sammy the Bull Gravano 
was in Supermax, wasn't he? Does anybody know? I'd like to ask, I'll ask Sammy, I know him. I'd like to ask him how he could become friends. Actually, he did a show recently where he said that there was somebody else that was at the Supermax. I believe this was it. That sent him a letter and was asking him questions. And, and Sammy's like, yeah, you know, meet me by the stairs or whatever the hell it was. So I don't know how that works. I should ask Sammy uh, if that's the case. Because I think there's only one Supermax, right? I mean, in prison, uh, in Colorado. I don't know how many there are. Yeah, so I don't know how he'd be how he'd become friends with them. So then the government sees the cabin, and they put on a display, as we saw, and you guys saw that. So now it's at the FBI museum, which is important to have. And then he, I was reading, he got transferred, not too long ago actually, on December fourteenth, two thousand twenty-one. He was transferred from the Supermax prison in Colorado to the Federal Medical Center in a place called Butner, North Carolina. Anybody know where the hell that is? Butner. Where the hell would that be? Where would there be a prison in North Carolina? Butner. It's not near the water. It wouldn't be in the center. Probably be out by the mountains somewhere, right? Probably be out by um, maybe Boone or Blowing Rock. Or would it be down out to, maybe towards Asheville, or or maybe more down towards towards Charlotte maybe, oh maybe probably between Charlotte and and Asheville, Butner B U T N E R anybody know where the hell that is? So why do you think they transferred him? I wonder, I wonder if he made some kind of deal with the government to be like, listen, get me the hell out of this freaking prison, this supermax. I'm a smart dude. I can help you come up with stuff. I could help you. I could be like the, you know, chat AI or AI chat, whatever the hell it's called. It's probably, you guys think you're typing up chat AI. It's probably really Ted Kaczynski uh, responding <laughs> on the other. I, would, I bet you Ted Kaczynski is working for Elon Musk. And he's probably the guy behind chat AI or AI. Wasn't he in Butner? That's what I just said. Where the hell's Butner? He's there now. Butner, North Carolina. Where the hell is that? Uh, da, 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 pull it up in a map. I never even heard of it. They should change their freaking name, though. Butner, 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 Butner. Oh, geez, it's right near Durham. Oh, it goes to show you what the hell I know. Wow. He's right above, he's between Durham and, well, there's really nothing above Durham, is there? That anybody's ever heard of. Uh, wow, Durham. What the hell is he doing there? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Duke University. Duke University. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is, let's be honest, uh, the equivalent of Ivy League, isn't it? Uh, it? It might be more difficult to get into University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill than it is to get into Duke. I know that sounds weird, but it, it might be true. Wow. I thought it'd be like out in the mountains or something. Holy cow. What's that all about? What's he doing there? I'm going to write to him. <laughs> Should I write to him? You know, I wrote a letter to Phil Spector. And he died just when he got the letter. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. What's that all about? I had good questions for him, too. All right, I'm going to write a letter to him. The only problem is I don't know how to spell his last name. Kaczynski. Is it with a Y or an I? Smoking a Durham? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, let's... Uh, pri uh, prison staff have not disclosed the precise reason for this transfer. Well, Duke University seems to be the only prison... Seems to be one of the few universities he didn't try to blow somebody up. So they're probably like, you know, and, and who the hell knows? Wow. Above Durham. Oh, it's a mental institution? Yeah, but why suddenly? Why suddenly would he have mental problems, right? I mean, look, he's friends with Timothy McVeigh, right? And the other dude, and they're writing letters back and forth. This guy's not crazy. I mean, you know, he's crazy in a different way, but he's not frothing at the mouth and, and thinking he's a duck. I don't think. He used to think he was a woman, though, or wanted to be. So... Let me see what I got here. I think I have his manifesto, don't I? Yeah. 
I'm supposed to end the stream in like one minute. What do I do about this? Why don't I read a little bit of his, why don't I read, I, I think, I think that a lot of people would enjoy listening it to it being read. And like I said, there's not that many people that did that, but it's freaking long. It's, um, let's see, it's 84 pages from what I have right now. And it's how many paragraphs? Good God, it's a lot. Couldn't shut this guy up. 232 paragraphs. I could read a little bit of it. Not much. Let's just get a flavor, shall we? Let's just get a little bit. And then what I can do is maybe I can, um, you know, read it in bits and pieces, like part one, part two, part three. I'll break it up into like maybe 10 each. And then what I'll do is I'll make it available for members only for a little while. And then I will make it available to everybody else. But that might be a thing. Yeah, do a whole stream of the manifesto. <laughs> My quickies are never that quick. Um, I know a few people that might disagree with that, that Brandy check. Anyway, let's go on. Editor's note. This is the text of a 35,000-word manifesto as submitted to the Washington Post and the New York Times by the serial mail bomber called the Unabomber. Oh, so they're not calling him a serial killer. That's interesting. That's interesting. The Whoever wrote this, which I'm assuming, oh, this is from the Washington Post. So some genius at the Washington Post seemed to have gotten something right. They didn't call him a serial killer. They called him a serial mail bomber. The manifesto appeared in the Washington Post as an eight-page supplement that was not part of the news section. This document contains corrections that appeared in the Friday, September 22nd, 1995 editions of Washington Post. The text was sent in June 1995 to the New York Times and the Washington Post by the person who calls himself F.C., identified by the FBI as the Unabomber, whom authorities have implicated in three murders and 16 bombings. The author threatened to send a bomb to an unspecified destination with intent to kill unless one of the newspapers published this manuscript. The attorney general and the director of the FBI recommended publication. You know what's interesting, you guys? I don't want to sit here all day long and beat up on the New York Times and the Washington Post, even though they deserve it. But let's let's beat up on them a little bit. If the Unabomber was around today doing his thing and the manifesto was out there, I bet you anything, because the newspapers in the United States are such garbage now, such propaganda trash, that I wouldn't be surprised if this was today, if he actually sent it off to people with YouTube channels. Don't you think? I mean, I would send it off. Imagine sending it off to Joe Rogan, right? If, if you had a choice, if you were the Unabomber or whatever it is, and you said to yourself, I could send this to the Washington Post, I could send it to the New York Times, or I could send it to Joe Rogan, I could send it to Timothy McVeigh, I could send it off to Scott Adams, Right. I'm just saying, uh, because you could say to yourself, well, who knows what the hell they'll do to it? They'll edit it. They'll do all kinds of crazy stuff. They'll take stuff out. And, and you know, and then he'll go around killing people because it's like, hey, I didn't tell you to take that sentence out. I want it like that. And by the way, well, you know what? Even better. Forget for, scratch some of that. Who the hell's even reading that anymore? That crap. More people. Well, oh, Tim Pool. More people. Listen to Tim Pool. And Joe Rogan and and uh, Scott Adams, not really, right? I don't know, a little bit. And um, Russell Brand, more people are listening to them on a daily basis than are reading these freaking newspapers, right? And so it just goes to show you, right, how much the world has changed, that the way to reach people now, and not to mention, you know, this is interesting, right? Because this is a guy who hates technology and all this other crap. And meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, had he done something like, now granted, what the hell would Joe Rogan have done with it? He's going to sit here and read it? Maybe, right? It's kind of a weird position to put him in. Hey, Joe Rogan, read this or I'm going to kill somebody. But at the same time, at least it would exist forever, right? Steve Crowder, yeah. I don't really watch him. I, I kind of know a little bit about that dude. I know he's popular, but I don't really know much about him. I try to watch his show. I don't really... I, you know what I feel like? I try to watch them a few times. I'm like, oh, this guy must be popular. I feel like, I've mentioned this before. I feel like my neighbor's having a party and I don't know him very well. And I don't know any of his friends. I don't know his family. And my neighbor's like, yeah, come on over, join our, you know, come hang out. And nobody will talk to me and nobody knows each other and they're hanging out. You're just kind of sitting in the corner and you're like, everybody already knows each other. And when I try to watch that Crowder guy and it's like, they have these inside jokes and they laugh nonstop and i'm like i don't know who any of you are i don't know what the hell you're laughing about i don't know your inside joke can you at least introduce yourself can you at least do something and it's like it just seems like a very badly produced show i hate to say it because i know the guy's popular i just feel like it's a very badly produced show tim pulls the exact opposite tim pulls like uh, hey uh, that's in and that's uh whoever and that's this person that's that person and and here's what the show is going to be about and here's what we're going to talk about and it's like very well put together right and Joe and, you know, Joe Rogan's just, you know, everybody, I, I didn't even know who the hell he was either until I'm the only guy on earth who knows that only that he's a podcast guy. I know he did other things, but I couldn't tell you what the hell any of those other things were. But either way, I'm just saying that these days, these days, I think that uh, the Unabomber would have sent his manifesto to, um, you know, people on YouTube and Twitter. Oh, hell, it's even better, right? You contact, oh, oh, God, look at this. Um, when when uh, Elon Musk did the uh, the Twitter files or whatever the hell they're called, right? And he had those journalists, right? Like two or three of them. And they're just releasing it in dribs and drabs. That would have been a cool thing for, not cool thing, it sounds awful. But imagine if the Unabomber was around today and he said, look, I want this released on Twitter. Okay, because that's obviously a lot easier. It's like, look, here it is. This is what I wrote. And it would get released on Twitter in dribs and drabs the way those Twitter files did. So that's one way. And, and yeah, I guess Facebook. I mean, I guess you could do this in a, a lot of different ways, right? Manifestos became a thing after that. Did they really? Was there a whole series of manifestos after? That's kind of cool. Uh, let me read just a little bit of it, then we'll get the heck out of here, because I actually have to put fluids into my cat, because I do that every week, and I usually do it on Wednesdays, but uh, it, it extends the life, by the way, of your cats, because you know, so many cats, they start having, um, you know, kidney failure, right, and so soon as the vet tells you that there's, that your cat is having signs of that, just start giving them fluids. Do it once a week, right? It's not medical advice, vet advice. I'm saying that's what I do. We do that. It just grab we, you know, grab the cat, say, come on, and give her give her or him their fluids. And then afterwards, give them some peanut butter, or a little snack, whatever it is, give them something to be happy, and then it's over. And at least they've got these nice fresh fluids, it gives them energy, and they're not thrilled sitting there, you know, with a hole in their back, you know, a needle in there. But it's over. It doesn't last long. Number one, the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. They have greatly increased the life expectancy of those of us who live in advanced countries, but they have destabilized society, have made life unfulfilling, have subjected Human beings to indignities have led to widespread psychological suffering. This is in a parent, parent, parentheses. In the third world to physical suffering as well and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. The continued development of technology will worsen the situation. It will certainly subject human beings to greater indignities and inflict greater damage on the natural world. It will probably lead to greater social disruption and psychological suffering, and it may lead to increased physical suffering even in advanced countries. 
All right, before I read any further, first of all, what a fantastic opening, right? What a great first sentence. Um, you, I don't know how many of you guys know the way this has been described as the equivalent in many ways to the book 1984 or um, well, Brave New World, right? Have you guys ever read Brave New World or, or 1984? For people living in the future right now, Let's hope that everything worked out, but the world we're living in right now is in 2023 and for the last, let's just say, uh, definitely the last two years, five years, 10 years, has been a uh, brave new world and 1984 come true. All of these things that science fiction writers, fiction writers predicted the world might be like if things got out of control are happening right now. The craziest, weirdest thing things you can imagine straight out of the books. It's not even, to be honest with you, it's not even that uh, unusual because you, you read the book, you're like, yeah, mm -hmm, that's happening. That's happening. It's like, it's like a bunch of people sitting around saying, hey, remember those books? Let's make that stuff happen, right? And now you live in a world where, yeah, Aldous Huxley, yeah, where uh, good luck to anybody under 30 or anybody really getting in a relationship. Good luck because, uh, you know, People are afraid of each other. Men are afraid to ask out women. Isn't that lovely? And and let me tell you something. Once upon a time, one of the reasons why, you know, one of the many reasons you'd want to be in a relationship is something called sex. People in the future might not know what sex is anymore, but now there's still some people that have it. And uh, porn is <laughs> available. And I was reading about, you know, these incredible sex dolls and sex robots and how they'll talk to you, you know, like... Hi, Jim. How are you? How was your day? And, and you'll be getting all this attention from this AI sex robot. And it's like, why the hell would you ask out a, you know, somebody who's going to, who knows, throw a toaster at you where you could be in a relationship with this uh, sex robot? And so it's just interesting to see the types of stuff that he was writing about. Number two. The industrial technological system may survive or it may break down. If it survives, it may eventually achieve a low level of physical and psychological suffering, but only after passing through a long and very painful period of adjustment and only at the cost of permanently reducing human beings and many other living organisms organisms, yeah, to engineered products and more cogs in the social machine. Furthermore, if the system survives, the consequences will be inevitable. There is no way of reforming or modifying the system so as to prevent it from depriving people of dignity and autonomy. Wow. Number three is a short one. If the system breaks down, the consequences will still be very painful. But the bigger the system grows, the more disastrous the results of its breakdown will be. So if it is to break down, it had best break down sooner rather than later. Number four, we therefore advocate a revolution against the industrial system. This revolution may or may not make use of violence. It may be sudden or it may be a relatively gradual process spanning a few decades. We can't predict any of that. But we do outline in a very general way the measures that those who hate the industrial system should take in order to prepare the way for a revolution against that form of society. This is not to be a political revolution. Its object will be to overthrow not governments, but the economic and technological basis of the present society. Um, who's got kids? How often do you let your kids get on the phone and play video games and stuff like that? It's been a long time, right? That people have just let their let their kids' computer or phone, just like TV before that, to be the babysitter, right? And I forgot who was here, who was Amish. Who was our lovely Amish friend, right? Once you're Amish, are you Amish forever? Or are you just like, I was Amish and I'm no longer Amish? How does the Amish thing work? I don't know how the Amish thing works. And does, does being Amish work? Because I have uh, a friend 
who's Mormon. And he has like, you know, uh, for those who don't know what Mormons are, anybody listening overseas, uh, they have like 90 brothers and sisters. They're everywhere. I don't even, I said to my friend, I said, how the hell do you remember their names? I mean, I have a lot of cousins and, I, and thankfully they all have the same name. We're all about the same age. We all have the same name, which is weird. Not a very creative family. <laughs> Everybody's got the same damn freaking name. If I told you how many Anthonys, how many cousin Anthonys and uncle Anthonys I've got, they're everywhere you look. A senior, a junior, or this, or that, everywhere. They, they name the girls Anthony. Everyone's a freaking Anthony. Um, that's yeah, one side of the family, anyway. But uh, you got, but the Mormons, I don't know, this guy is a pretty happy family. Just saying. I mean, who the hell knows what goes on behind the closed doors, but I'm just saying, pretty happy dude. Every time I talk to him, he's traveling, he's meeting his family here, there's a wedding, there's a funeral, they're in Europe, they're traveling around, and there's a great affection, right? And they're not spending all this time on the freaking computer, right? I mean, they're still getting to know each other, and they're still physical and hugging and whatever the hell it is, you know, people, some people still do. So, yeah, they get shunned if they leave, is that it? You're Amish forever? Once you're Amish? It's like being a jet. Once you're a jet, you're a jet all the way. Once you're a jet. How's that song go? I should know this. West Side Story. I don't think they really do the multiple wives thing, Jonathan. I don't, I mean, I think, I don't know if they do. I don't think it's a thing. Is it? I don't think, it's, but you can't really anymore. I think it was like a hundred years ago. I could be wrong. Who the hell knows? Uh, I don't know, but it sounds like a good deal to me, to be honest with you. Uh, you were born and raised Mormon. You're not active anymore, but the families are close. I think he's Mormon. What's the Utah, the Utah crowd? Yeah, the Mormons. Okay. Uh, number five, in this article, we give attention to only some of the negative developments that have grown out of the, you know what? This is the introduction. Let's just move forward. Let's get to some good stuff. Number six, the psychology of modern leftism. This, so this was written at, at least in 95, but prior to that. Let me tell you something. As a guy who writes books, this took a while. If smart or not, this took a lot. This took a while. He probably was working on this on and off for 10 years, maybe longer. Almost everyone will agree that we live in a deeply troubled society. One of the most widespread manifestations of the craziness of our world is leftism. So, a discussion of the psychology of leftism can serve as an introduction to the discussion of the problems of modern society in general. Number seven, but what is leftism? During the first half of the 20th century, leftism could have been practically identified with socialism. Today, the movement is fragmented and it is not clear who can properly properly be called a leftist. When we speak of leftists in this article, we have in mind mainly socialists, collectivists, politically correct types, feminists, gay and disability, act and disability activists, animal rights activists, hey, watch it, Ted, and the like. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Disability activists? I don't even know where that fits in. <laughs> Uh, are people really a problem that say, you know, there really should be a ramp going into that building instead of some stairs? I mean, I don't know. What is a disability activist? You know, hey, you know, I know you want to put it in a spiral staircase, but can you put it in an elevator too? I mean, why is that a problem? Uh, but not everyone who is associated with one of these movements is a leftist. Okay, that's true. What we are trying to get at in discussing leftism is not so much movement or an ideology as a psychological type, or rather a collection of related types. Thus, what we mean by leftism will emerge more clearly in the course of our discussion of leftist psychology. Wow, I almost want to jump right to that. <laughs> he actually says where it is. It's paragraphs 227 to 230. Let's read a little bit more, and if it looks boring, we'll just jump to that and see what that has to say, because why wouldn't he continue? All right, well, and actually it does. Eight, you'd love a spiral staircase? Everybody would love a spiral staircase, Susan, everybody. The problem with spiral staircases is you have to be very careful where you put them because you could lead it up to your loft, okay, great. So you have a loft. 
And the main reason it's good for a loft is if you're going to be able to put furniture up there, at least you could find another way to get the furniture up there because there isn't, when you have a spiral staircase, you, you're limited on what you could bring up, right? You're not bringing up your, your grandmother's I, um, Singer sewing machine built into the, you know, the antique table. It's, it'll take you forever and you're banging it into the staircase on the left and the right and uh, nightmare. So how much can you really carry up a spiral staircase? So it seems like a loft is the best way to go. Does anybody have a spiral staircase? And if you have a spiral staircase, where does it lead? And how can you, you're not getting a mattress up there. That's not happening. You have to be slim to use a spiral staircase. Yeah, that depends on the spiral staircase, but yeah, that's all right. Uh, number eight. Even so, our conception of leftism will remain a good deal less clear than we would wish. But there doesn't seem to be any remedy for this. All we are trying to do here is indicate in a rough and approximate way the two psychological tendencies that we believe are the main driving force of modern leftism. This is pretty interesting because like I said, when did he write this? Because, uh, you know, if he knows what's going on in the world right now, he must be going out of his mind. Uh, so anyway, let's see. Um, we by no means claim to be telling the whole truth about leftist psychology. Also, our discussion is meant to apply to modern leftism only. We leave open the question of the extent to which our discussion could be applied to the leftists of the 19th and early, early 20th centuries. Number nine. The two psychological tendencies that underlie modern leftism we call, and this is, uh, these are in quotes here, feelings of inferiority and, and this is another quote, over-socialization. Feelings of inferiority are characteristic of modern leftism as a whole, while over-socialization is characteristic only of a certain segment of modern leftism. But this segment is highly influential. What do you guys think? What do, what's your definition of over, over socialization? What do you guys think that means? An IKEA futon. An IKEA futon, yes, John, thank you. Uh, John is correct. An IKEA futon could probably make its way up a spiral staircase if that is what you're referring to. I want to know what the hell he means by over socialization. I know what it means, but let's see if we can get a proper definition. A focus on innate behavior at the expense of learning is termed under socialization while attributing behavior to learning when it is the result of evolution is termed over socialization. So what's an example? Uh, for example, we're not supposed to hate anyone yet. Almost everyone hates somebody at some time or other. Well, yeah. whether he admits it to himself or not. Okay. Caught me. Some people are so highly socialized that the attempt to think, feel, and act morally imposes a severe burden on them. Huh. You guys have any thoughts about over socialization? I'm trying to think of a, if I can get an easier definition here. Over socialization, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, is social media killing your individuality? Wow. He further argued that over-socialization can lead to low self-esteem, a sense of powerlessness, defeatism, and guilt. Someone becomes socialized when they internalize the goods of society into their moral space. We still need a good ant. Like if you're in a you're in a uh, you're in an escalator with somebody, I'd say elevator, but nobody ever says escalator. So what the hell not? Let's talk about escalators. You're on an escalator to, with somebody and they say, hey, what's your definition of over-socialization? It seems like there needs to be a simpler way to answer that. Hey, I'll ask chat AI. Is that what it's called? Chat open AI. Yeah. Let's ask that. Let's go in there. What is over-socialization? Over-socialization refers to a concept in sociology and psychology that suggests that excessive socialization can have negative effects on an individual's ability to think critically and independently. The theory argues 
that too much socialization can result in a lack of creativity and independent thought, as well as an over-reliance on authority figures and established social norms. This can be particularly problematic in situations where societal norms or cultural practices are too discriminatory or harmful, as individuals may be less likely to challenge these norms or question their validity. Some researchers suggest that over-socialization can lead to conformity, groupthink, and a reluctance to challenge established authority. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of freaking over-socializations the last few years, haven't we, guys? However, it is important to note that this is a contested concept in the social sciences, and there is an ongoing debate about the extent to which socialization can be considered over-excessive. I don't know. What do you guys think? In 2020 and 21 and 22, do you think, do you think there were as any, can anybody think of any examples where people lacked independent thought and were over-reliant on authority figures? <laughs> anybody think of that? Was that problematic, would you say? You never know. Good God. All right. Americans call them elevators. What do you call them? Oh, it lifts. Lifts sounds cheap. Uh, it, I think in the United States, the word lifts, I think, I think if the word does get used at all, it's more for maybe commercial elevators, right? That's what I would, I would consider a lift in the United States anyway. But yeah, elevators. Lifts a good word though. I like the word lifts. It's a good word. Uh, where do we leave off? Uh, number nine. Oh, number 10. Oh, 10. This is getting good. This is good. Did I read nine yet? Okay, 10. By feelings of inferiority, we mean not only inferiority feelings in the strict sense, but a whole spectrum of related traits. Traits? Traits? Oh my, uh, that wabbit? Where'd the wabbit? Uh, related traits. Low self-esteem, feelings of powerlessness, depressive tendencies, defeatism, guilt, self-hatred, etc. We argue that modern leftists tend to have some such feelings, possibly more or less repressed, and that these feelings are decisive in determining the direction of modern leftism. You know, when I was thinking about feelings of inferiority, I was watching something the other day, and they were saying that, you know, I go on, I don't even want to go on Instagram, right? I mean, but I, I follow a lot of like, you know, architecture groups, history groups, stuff like that. And it's like nonstop, beautiful 23-year-olds, right? Or 22-year-olds or whatever the hell age they are, right? And you think to yourself, it's got to suck to be a girl and and to see these inc unbelievably attractive women doing all of these short videos and getting 900,000 views and thinking, my God, look at me. I'm, I don't look like that. But the thing to remember is the types of women that are doing videos like that are smoking hot women. And so that's not an example of what most people look like. And so you got to feel sorry for like some teenage girls that are like, I don't look like that. It's like, yeah, most girls don't. The ones that do make those freaking videos, okay? Normal looking girls aren't making videos because nobody wants to watch them, right? Still talking about spiral staircases. The strange history of spiral staircases. Number 11, when someone interprets as derogatory almost anything that is said about him or about groups with whom he identifies, we conclude that he has, an, he has inferiority feelings or low self-esteem. This tendency is pronounced among minority rights activists, whether or not they belong to the minority groups whose rights they defend. They are hypersensitive about the words used to designate minorities and about anything that is said concerning minorities. Good God, could this have been written today or not? I mean, seriously. Uh, I don't know if I could read some of these words. The terms, one starts with an N, ends with an O. The next one, Oriental, that should be fine. Handicapped or chick for an African, an Asian, a disabled person, or a woman 
originally had no derogatory connotation. Broad and chick were merely the feminine equivalents of guy, dude, or fellow. I agree with that. Are there any women out there, any of the ladies here? Do you see chick as a derogatory term? I don't, I don't, maybe I see, you know what? I'm, I'm not a good person. I'm not a good person to ask because I watch so many old movies and I read so many, you know, vintage books. I'm used to seeing, you know, like chick doesn't mean anything to me, but does anybody see that? Do you see that as derogatory? Chick? I mean, in Abbott and Costello, um, at least one of their movies, I'm trying to think which one, uh, he actually called, Lou Costello actually called Bud Abbott Chick, like throughout the whole freaking movie. That was like his name, Chick, 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 Chick. It was just a, you know, whatever. Right? I don't know. Is that derogatory? For an African Asian disabled person. Okay, so I could, uh, the, the N, the word that, the, the, the word that starts with an N and ends with an O. Yeah, I could see that as being derogatory. Oriental, I don't think that's, is that, is that, that's not really, right? Is that, is that any, first of all, who the hell says Oriental anymore? I don't even know the last time I heard anybody even say that. Oriental. I don't even know what the hell that means anymore. <laughs> does that even mean anything? Um, what does that even mean anymore? But I don't, is that, is that derogatory? Oh, she's Oriental, he's Oriental. I'm not sure if that's derogatory. I, I, I don't think handicapped is derogatory either, is it? Um, but anyway, broad and chick. Well, broad, okay. But chick seems fine. The negative connotations have been attached to these terms. Dame. <laughs> Dollface. <laughs> that brandy chick. Yeah, you might have to change it to that brandy broad. We're mere, if you want to be offensive. Where it's merely the feminine equivalent of guy, dude, or fellow. The negative connotations have been attached to these terms by the activists themselves. Some animal rights activists have gone so far as to reject the word pet. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. Let's see what else he says. Um, and insist on its replacement by animal companion. I don't say animal companion because humans are animals. And so I, I actually say non-human uh, animal rather than, I, I would never say animal companion. I'd say furry friend, furry friend. That's, I think in the strange history society, I think we could all agree that furry friend is the best terminology for our furry friends, wouldn't you agree? I mean, why call them a pet? Why call them an animal companion when we can say furry friend? They're furry, right? It's not like they're not, they are furry and they are our friends. They are our furry friends. Let, I'm gonna write to him. I'm going to say, listen, on, uh, on paragraph 11, when you're mentioning animal companion, just so you know, because uh, you've been under-socialized, uh, you don't know that the proper terminology is actually furry friend, Ted. Please don't send a bomb to my house. Uh, leftish, left, leftish anthropologists go to great lengths to avoid saying anything about primitive peoples that could conceivably be interpreted as negative. They want to replace the word primitive by non-literate. They seem almost paranoid about anything that might suggest that any primitive culture is inferior to our own. And then in parentheses, he writes, we do not mean to imply that primitive cultures are inferior to ours. We merely point out the hypersensitivity of leftish anthropologists. Um, it's interesting. Did you guys notice? You notice that he he uses the word we and ours. Did you guys notice that? It's just him. It's just him. But he's using the words we and ours to throw investigators off the scent that it's one person. Does that sound like uh, somebody who's schizophrenic to you? Does that sound like somebody who's crazy? Does that sound like somebody like that? I don't think so. Number 12, those who are most sensitive about politically correct terminology are not the average black ghetto dweller, Asian immigrant, abused woman, or disabled persons, but a minority of activists, 
many of whom do not even belong to any oppressed group, but come from privileged strata of society. <laughs> you guys have to watch uh, uh, Jordan Peterson's latest video. <laughs> he just, well, I don't know what today's date is, but it, I think it came out today. But he's so right. He's talking about this. It's kind of like in the United States, for those who aren't Americans, there's always like some, a bunch of 25 year old rich white women that are bitching about the names of uh, football uh, teams that I guess are named after Native Americans or something. It's like, you can't say that. That's, that's offensive to Native Americans. And then they ask Native Americans, they're like, ah, what, what? What do we care? What? They're called the Warriors? No. Why? What's wrong with that? They're called the Seminoles? No, that's cool. No, it's offensive. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You should be offended. I'm not offended. Well, I'll be offended for you then. Don't, don't be. I'm offended on your behalf. Don't, don't be offended on my behalf. We don't care. Too damn bad. It's offensive. <laughs> this is the crazy shit we're dealing with these days. I'm speaking to people in the future. God, I hope it works out for you. I hope it works out. But yeah, a bunch of 24-year-old grad students driving around in their BMWs that their dad bought them, being offended on everybody else's behalf. Ah, oh, God, this is so funny. All right, let's read this. This is great. We should just keep doing this show. Every night we should read from the... You know, it wasn't uh, Redskins. What was that? Let's call them the Commanders. The only people that didn't get upset is uh, FSU, right? Florida State University, they're the Seminoles. And I guess people bitch and they're like, screw you. But the damn Seminoles, leave us the hell alone. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, okay, this is great. A minority of activists, many of whom do not even belong to any oppressed group, but come from privileged strata of society. Political correctness has its stronghold among university professors. Wow. Yeah who have secure employment with comfortable salaries, and the majority of whom are heterosexual white males <laughs> from middle to upper middle class families. That's true. It's true. I went to a play once. It was like a friend of mine's a playwright, a very good playwright. And he said, look, there's this guy that I know, and he's, he's putting on a reading. You know, you know what a reading is? Before you, you write a play, and then you get these actors together and there's different types of readings. They can sit around the table or they can just kind of like rough, you know, uh, they start memorizing their dialogue or they could walk around with their scripts. And, you know, it's just to kind of get an idea of what works, what doesn't work. And so my friend says, listen, I can't go. Uh, I'm busy that night. Can you do me a favor? Just go on my behalf. Right. And, uh, you know, just tell me a friend of mine and you're there. So I said, I don't feel like it. But he's like, yeah, please. Can you do it? I promised them I could go and I, I can't go. So I said, fine. So I went to it and it was exactly what Ted Kaczynski here said. It was a, this guy was a heterosexual white male, rich dude, probably in his sixties. And he wrote a play and it was all black characters. This freaking dick thought that he could write a whole play about with, you know, the men, the women, the old, young, he's writing dialogue for entire black people. And it's all about how they're all pissed off about stuff. Right. And so I'm in the, I'm in the reading. I mean, I'm, I'm watching it and there's a few people there. And, and one of the ladies next to me, she was a black lady. And afterward, the, the, uh, the playwright's like, well, you know, that was our reading. Do you guys have any thoughts? Do you have any feedback? And she went off on him. Like you wouldn't freaking believe. She said, you, sir, you've been watching too many episodes of good times. <laughs> Nobody talks like this. She goes, what the hell are you writing this for? Why don't you write about something that you know? Black people don't talk like this. And then she starts saying to the cast, how the hell do you agree to even be in a play like this? Nobody talks like this. We don't talk like this. What the hell is this? This is like an episode of Good Times. She went off on him and I'm just sitting there watching. And he didn't know what the hell to say. He didn't know what the hell to say. <clears throat> but seriously, stay in your freaking lane, dude. <laughs> Ready to play. This is how black people talk. I mean, come on. I know mine. <laughs> Good times. Uh, 13. Many leftists have an intense identification with the problems of groups that have an image of being weak. 
and then in parentheses he writes women, defeated, American Indians, repellent, and then he writes homosexuals, or otherwise inferior. The leftists themselves feel that these groups are inferior. They would never admit to themselves that they have such feelings, but it is precisely because they do see these groups as inferior that they identify with their problems. And then he puts in parentheses, we do not mean to suggest that women, Indians, etc., are inferior. We are only making a point about leftist psychology. You know what's interesting? There's no italics in this. When he wants to italicize something, he puts them all in uppercase. So when I say the word R, this is not Scott Cardinal, um, you know, uh, doing any editing. I'm not sitting here. I'm not trying to accentuate words. I'm just reading this to you. I'm not saying whether I agree with it, or don't agree with it. I'm just saying that I'm when I do that, he actually has it all in caps. And so he seems to do that with the word R a lot. And then there's another one coming up in the next one. It's the word not. Okay, so I'll I'll read the word not. I will, you know, um, you know, just raise my tone a little bit because that's how it's meant to be written. Okay. Fourteen, feminists are desperately anxious to prove that women are as strong and as capable of men. Well, clearly he has not been watching any sports lately. Uh, <laughs> clearly, that's me. That's not you. That's not in the whatever the hell it's called manifesto. Feminists are desperately anxious to prove that women are as strong and as capable as men. Clearly, they are nagged by a fear that women may not, okay, there's a caps because he probably meant to be ital italicized, may not be as strong and as capable as men. 15. I wish I was hanging out in the chat with you guys. You're probably having a ton of fun, right? I'm missing out on all the fun because I get to do all the work here. This is unbelievable. If this guy, if this wasn't written by a by a, a mass murderer, if this wasn't written by a guy, right? You'd be like, wow, this is like Twitter stuff. I mean, these are all like Twitter, these are like tweets. Um, 15. Leftists tend to hate anything that has an image of being strong, good, and successful. They hate America. They hate Western civilization. They hate white males. They hate rationality. The reason that leftists give for hating the West clearly do not respond with their real motives. They say, there's a caps there, they say they hate the West because it is warlike, imperialistic, sexist, ethnocentric, and so forth. But where these same faults appear in socialist countries or in primitive cultures, the leftists find excuses for them, or at best, he grudgingly admits that they exist. Whereas he enthusiastically points out and often greatly exaggerates these faults where they appear in Western civilization. Thus, it is clear that these faults are not the leftist real motive for hating America and the West. He hates America and the West because they are strong and successful. Wow. He had, you know, I think he had to have started writing this in the eighties. Had to have, had to have. This is an enormous amount of work to write this. I'm only on number 15 and there's like what? 232 of these. And no doubt, you know, he spent a lot of time thinking and writing it and rewriting it and going back and, and recalibrating, right, his thoughts and maybe changing things here and there. This wasn't something he whipped together in, in a week. This is something he really spent a good portion of his life on. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, 16. Words like self-confidence, self-reliance, initiative, enterprise, optimism, etc. play little role in the liberal and leftist vocabulary. The leftist is anti-individualistic, pro-collectivist. He wants society 
to solve everyone's problems for them, satisfy everyone's needs for them, take care of them. He is not the sort of person who has an inner sense of confidence in his ability to solve his own problems and satisfy his own needs. The left in, I'm sorry, the leftist is antagonistic to the concept of competition because deep inside, he feels like a loser. Oh, ouch. Ouch. Let me tell you, there's no way in a million years the New York Times or the Washington Post would have published this today. They would have taken one look at this and they would have said, let them keep on killing people. There's no freaking way we are publishing this today. No chance. 17. Art forms that appeal to modern leftish. I wonder why he says leftish. He doesn't say leftist. He says leftish. That's an interesting term. What do you guys think about that? About him using the terminology leftish. Is that a word? That's more of like slang, isn't it? Leftish. Leftish. Number 17. Art forms that appeal to modern leftish intellectuals tend to focus on sordidness, defeat, and despair. Or else they take an orgiastic tone throwing off rational control as if there were no hope of accomplishing anything through rational calculation and all that was left was to immerse oneself in the sensations of the movement. He should have expanded upon that. Not too sure. I mean, art forms that appeal to modern leftist intellectuals tend to focus on sordidness, defeat, and despair. What do you think he means by art forms? Because, you know, it's not just art, right? Is he talking about music? Is he, do you think he's referring to music as an art form? Oh, yeah, and, and, uh, and I guess broadcasting, right? And films? What, do you, what is your definition when you think of art forms? You think of music, right? You don't just think of art, right? You don't just think of paintings. You think of music. You probably think of films. You think of TV shows, right? So if you think about it that way, and what, what was... What was I think a lot of people agree that something weird happened in the early 90s in the United States, that the grunge music killed a lot because it became so popular, right? And, uh, and, and it got rid of you know, like the 80s, the pop songs, the fun songs. You still had some fun songs here and there. But for the most part, grunge and gangsta rap, gangsta rap killed all the fun rap, right? Because what was that guy's name? The lunatic who punched uh, Chris Rock. What's that guy's name? Wasn't he in a fresh something, fresh world, fresh fruit, fresh oranges, fresh, fresh something, some fresh dude, fresh something. But but yeah, hip hop, right? There was like there was fun hip hop. What was that that big rap song that um, Rappers Delight, which was in the late seventies, I think, right? Rappers Delight, and so that was fun. And then the 80s, you had stuff, and then the early 90s. But then they, I think the gangster rap, I think, drowned out a lot of the other stuff. Yeah? I mean, I don't know. Fresh Prince, that's it. Yeah, Will Smith. Yeah, wasn't Will Smith like a fun rapper at one point, right? He was just kind of doing some fun stuff. Yeah, Jazzy Jeff, yeah. So you had that kind of thing. But then there was that. And then you had grunge, and it just killed a lot of the pop music. So I wonder if that's what he's... He does. Maybe there's more coming up, but I guess that might be what he's referring to. Yeah. Sugar Hill Gang. Thank you, Patricia. Sugar Hill Gang. That was a fun song. Rapper's Delight. <laughs> you have the 12 inch vinyl of Rapper's Delight. Do you really? That's funny. Oh my God. Rapper's Delight. Number 18. For those who are just joining, this isn't Scott Cardinal talking. This isn't. This is the Unabomber's manifesto. We went through his life. We talked about what happened to this guy. He really got tormented. Um, I, I wonder if a lot of this is also because of the way that professors mistreated him, right? And so, however they think, 
he just wants to think the opposite because he figures these are some pretty freaking evil people for what they did to him. Because it wasn't just one professor. I mean, they they really ran this guy, you know, through the ringer, not just when he was a student, but even when he was a you know associate professor, right? And he's in Berkeley for crying out loud of all places. And so you can imagine the types of professors that he was with, and he probably just really hated them. And so he's taken out a lot of his frustration right you bought it new at a record store in a mall <laughs> what's a record store <laughs> that's funny 18 modern leftish philosophers tend to dismiss reason science objective reality and to insist that everything is culturally relative it is true that one can ask serious questions about the foundations of scientific knowledge and about how, if at all, the concept of objective reality can be defined. But it is obvious that modern leftish philosophers are not simply cool-headed logicians systematically analyzing the foundations of knowledge. They are deeply involved emotionally in their attack on truth and reality. They attack these concepts because of their own psychological needs. For one thing, their attack is an outlet for hostility. And to the extent that it is successful, it satisfies the drive for power. More importantly, the leftists hate science and rationality because they classify certain beliefs as true, being successful, being superior, and other beliefs as false, um, failing, inferior. The leftist feelings of inferiority run so deep that he cannot tolerate any classification of some things as successful or superior and other things as failed or inferior. This also underlies the rejection by many leftists of the concept of mental illness and of the utility of IQ tests. Wow. Wow. I am not interpreting anything for any of you guys. I'm just reading. I'm just minding my own business here. I'm just doing my job. But I'm going to read that again. This also underlies the rejection by many leftists of the concept of mental illness and of the utility of IQ tests. Leftists are antagonistic to genetic explanations of human abilities or behavior because such explanations tend to make some persons appear superior or inferior to others. Leftists prefer to give society the credit or blame for an individual's ability or lack of it. Thus, if a person is inferior, it is not his fault, but society's, because he was not, he has not been brought up properly. Interesting. I didn't realize, you know, I read this a long time ago. Like I said, I, I read this, I, I think it was probably 22, maybe 23, maybe 24, maybe, but I don't think so. I might have been. I think I read it when I was in college. I don't even know. It was, yeah, I, 20, I think I was 22. I don't remember it being uh, this politically oriented. And I don't know how much longer this lasts. Oh, oh, it ends actually in a few more. They, it goes to over-socialization. Okay, so he's almost off this kick. But I don't, rec I don't really recall it being like this. And, you know, and also probably because at the time, this, this stuff didn't stand out too too much as it does today yeah all right let's see 19 the leftist and by the way this is all bonus time with you guys this is all bonus time i should have ended this an hour ago brandy and the great linda is cat ninja even around anymore cat ninja he's still with us what time is it for cat ninja poor cat ninja uh it's like 4 30 in the freaking morning there's no way cat ninja's still around no way and I wouldn't blame the great Brandy or the great Linda if they went off. Linda and Kat are both gone. Well, 
Brandy, go, 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 go. Everybody will behave, I promise. Don't worry. Everybody, do you all agree to behave if the great Brandy chick goes for a swim or, you know, goes running around her backyard screaming and playing with ribbons or whatever? Yes, bonus time. I'm only going to go to 23 because the next one is over socialization. I'm not going to get into that. I'll read that another time. Let me at least get to one, two, three, four. I got five more paragraphs. Okay, let's do it. 19. The leftist is not typically the kind of person whose feelings of inferiority make him a braggart, an egotist, a bully, a self-promoter, a ruthless competitor. This kind of person has not wholly lost faith in himself. He has a deficit in his sense of power and self-worth, but he can still conceive of himself as having the capacity to be strong and his efforts to make himself strong produce his unpleasant behavior. But the leftist is too far gone for that. His feelings of inferiority are so ingrained that he cannot conceive of himself as individually strong and valuable. Hence, the collectivism of the leftist. He can feel strong only as a member of a large organization or a mass movement with which he identifies himself. Wow. Wow. Anybody else saying wow? I mean, this guy wrote this pretty freaking long time. Uh, what year was this? I don't even, did I say? It was 95, wasn't it? Let me just double check. I wonder. I'm, I'm just trying to wonder if he, if when he started writing it, when he started, because he's been, he's been gone for 95, 95. That was a long freaking time ago, right? That's uh, it's been a while. Yeah, he's uh, he's pissed off. Number 20, notice the masochistic tendency of leftist tactics. Leftists protest by lying down in front of vehicles. They intentionally provoke police or racists to abuse them. These tactics may often be effective, but many leftists use them not as a means to an end, but because they prefer masochistic tactics self-hatred is a leftist trait what do you guys think that means masochistic tactics what do you think that means any idea i'll read this again tell me what you think these tactics may often be effective but many leftists use them not as a means to an end but because they prefer and prefer by the way is in all caps prefer masochistic tactics. Self-hatred is a leftist trait. Wow. 21. Wait, Cat Ninja still here? No, no, no. Cat Ninja's not here still. Is Cat Ninja still? Cat Ninja! Our clocks change on Sunday, so it'll be an hour later. <laughs> what is that? So, so it would be 5.30 instead of 4.30? Oh my God, Cat Ninja, I am coming to the UK and I am buying you some tea and scones. And guess who I'm bringing with me? Guess who I'm going to bring along? I'm going to bring along Trudy. Trudy will come along. Scott, you're mentioning my name. I had to say my name. Hi, everybody. It's Trudy. Good to see you, strange historians. How you doing? What you guys talking about? What you talking about, Scott? What you got going on here? The, yeah, the bomb, you know, you know, bomb. Oh, I don't heard about the guy with the bombs. Yes, I heard about him. Oh, he wrote that manifesto. Oh, it's a fantastic thing. I drank that. I had some tea and some scans and I watched it. It was a wonderful experience. So, okay, I got to go, everybody. Just wanted to pop in and say hi. See you later. Bye, Trudy. Catch up to you. All right. He wrote it well. 
1995, it got published, but it seems like he probably worked on it for quite a while, wouldn't you say? So anyway, Cat Ninja, thank you very much for your uh, for being here. Cat Ninja is awesome. All right, let's see. Where do we leave off? 21. We got three more to go. You ready? 21. Leftists may claim that their activism is motivated by compassion or by moral principles. Well, all right. I'm going to uh, mute my mic for a second, take a long uh, sip of my delicious beverage, and be right back. Hang tight, you guys. All righty, I am back. Hey, look who's here. Our friend Lala HK. How are you? Good to see you. Great mod for my friend, Jericho Green, who I've known for quite a while, actually. Um, good to see you. Uh, who was gifted a membership, I believe, uh, a couple of days ago, right? Not too long ago. So good to see you. Thanks for popping in. Um, yes. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, all right, so off we go. It is so cool that we have so many new people joining us with our new branding, our new strange history stuff, which we kind of already was doing anyway, but that was worth staying up for, Cat Ninja? You mean talking to Mickey wouldn't have been worth? Don't worry, he's not coming. All right, 21. Uh, where do we leave off? Oh, okay. 21. Leftists may claim, for those who are just joining us, this is about, well, I don't need to tell you. It says it right there on the screen. The Unabomber Manifesto. Hey, wait a minute. Did I go through all of my slides? The investigation, $1 million reward. I'll go back to this in a second. I want to make sure I go through all my slides. There was the reward. Then he got arrested, obviously. We saw that. And he's got that good hair, which we talked about previously. Uh, pled guilty. Let me tell you something. I'm not joking about this. Good hair. Ted Kaczynski's got really good freaking hair. And, uh, well, not so much there, but, you know, at one point. At one point, this dude had the hair. Look at that hair. This is like Saturday Night Fever hair. My hair. You know, I, I work really hard on my hair, and, and, he, and he hits it. He, he hits my hair. Anybody know what that's from? Saturday Night Fever? The dinner scene. He stays downstairs eating spaghetti or whatever with his, he's got like a big towel wrapped around his shirt because he's wearing like an iridescent silk shirt or whatever, polyester, right? Remember that? My hair. It's my hair. Hey, watch the hair, will you? All right, number 21. Leftists may claim that their activism is motivated by compassion or by moral principles. And moral principle does play a role for the leftist of the over-socialized type. But compassion and moral principle cannot be the main motives for leftism, I'm sorry, leftist activism. Hostility is too prominent a component of leftist behavior. So is the drive for power. Moreover, much leftist behavior is not rationally calculated to be of benefit to the people whom the leftists claim to be trying to help. For example, if one believes that affirmative action is good for black people, does it make sense to demand affirmative action in hostile or dogmatic terms? Obviously, it would be more productive to take a diplomat, I'm sorry, take a diplomatic and conciliatory approach that would make at least verbal and symbolic concessions to white people to think that affirmative action discriminates against them. But leftist activists do not take such an approach because it would not satisfy their emotional needs. Helping black people is not their real goal. 
Instead, race problems serve as an excuse for them to express their own hostility and frustrated need for power. In doing so, they actually harm black people because the activist hostile attitude toward the white majority tends to intensify race hatred. Wow. Patricia's so smart. Patricia's so, so smart, I don't even know what she's talking about, but I believe her. <laughs> Apparently, his manifesto is a synthesis of ideas from three academics. Jacques Ellul? Is, it, is that his name? Jacques? Oh, Jacques? You know, when I was a kid, I still have it, by the way, because I have all my books from when I was a kid. I have, like, every book, pretty much, that I've had my entire life. I have my Curious George books. I do. Don't think I don't. I have Curious George. I have uh, the uh, Purple Crayon. What the hell is his name? Oh, God. How did I forget the name of it? Is it Charlie and the Purple? No. Who's the one with the Purple Crayon? Now, the kid with the Purple Crayon, he's drawing everything. I love that book. I still have it. Um, but anyway, I had a book from Jacques Cousteau because when I was a kid, you know, I love that, you know, sharks and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, I said to my dad, I'm like, Jackis? Jackis Yves, Jackis Yves Cousteau? What kind of name is that? Jackis. Jackie, Jackius? Yves? 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 But it's not. Any French, any of my, any strange historians here of French or speak French? Isn't it Jacques? And I think it's Yves, right? Yves. Jacques Yves Cousteau. So anyway, I'm assuming this is Jacques Elul, Desmond Morris, wait, wait, where'd you go? Sorry, things going up. And Martin Seligman. Seligman? Yeah. So I'm assuming, Patricia, that those are some smart dudes. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, yeah, uh, without a doubt, like so many other people. Oh, Harold in the purple crayon. Thank you, Lori. Of course, Lori would help. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Um, so, yeah, without a doubt, like anybody else, you know, you, you, um, you know, you learn from books, you learn from other people and you, you, you formulate your own ideas based on what other people have put forth. So that's very interesting. Thank you, Patricia, for sharing that. Very helpful. I love Harold and the Purple Crayon. It's such a good, it's such a good book. Uh, all right. Where do we leave off? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read the last sentence again, and then we'll finish. So this was the last sentence in 21. Uh, instead, race problems serve as an excuse for them to express their own hostility and frustrated need for power. In doing so, they actually harm black people because the activist hostile attitude toward the white majority tends to intensify race hatred. Wow. Uh, 22. You guys don't know Harold in the Purple Crayon? Is there anybody here who doesn't know Harold in the Purple Crayon? It's the cutest book. It really is. I should read it sometime. Your great nan was French. Jacques Yves. Jacques. Jacques Yves. Jack. It's not Jack. Right? It's Jacques because it's French. If it's British, it should be Jack. But Jacques. Jacques. Jacques Yves. Jacques Yves. Uh, number 22. If our society had no social problems at all, the leftists would have to invent. This is uh, and this isn't Scott Cardinal having fun with words. These are all capitals. The word invent is capitals. Otherwise, I talk perfectly normal, as you know. If our society had no social problems at all, the leftists would have to invent problems in order to provide themselves with an excuse for making a fuss. Number 23, number 23, we emphasize that the foregoing does not pretend to be an accurate description of everyone who might be considered a leftist. It is only a rough indication of a general tendency of leftism. Exactly. I agree with that completely. Listen, especially here in the strange history society, everybody's welcome. Vote for who you want. Do what you want. 
Don't harm anybody. Don't harm any animals. That's all we care about here, right? Have an interest in different things. Be kind to people. Be kind to animals. It's fine. Everybody's allowed. Listen, I don't want to live in a world where everybody thinks alike. I do not want that world. Nobody should want a world like that. You want people to argue a little bit. You want people to think differently. Because you know what? You don't want to have such an ego. You don't want to be so convinced that you're right about everything, that you don't get any pushback at all, because you might be wrong about something. And so it's all right. People can do that. People can think whatever they want and, and whatever it is. And if you have good intentions, that's, you know, uh, more important than anything else. So, yeah. So, I look, I'm just reading this. Anybody, this doesn't, you know, nobody has to take this personally. Nobody's think, oh, God, it's good. So good. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm reading somebody else's thing. This isn't me. Uh, but, you know, but it's interesting, right? And, and it's uh, it's fascinating how, you know, squares are, you know, fitting into the peg here. And, and uh, you know, he gets a lot of stuff right. There's not a doubt about it. Doesn't doesn't make anybody. Uh, it, 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 you can't just say, well, it's, this, this applies to everybody. It doesn't, right? But, uh, yeah, yes, variety is the spice of life. Exactly. That's, uh, that's a sign that they put above the... Um, uh, clubs for swingers. That's from what I've heard. I wouldn't know personally. <laughs> Don't know. Uh, Pluto is not a planet. Damn it, Kathy. Do not get me started on Pluto. Pluto. I I I get upset about Pluto sometimes. I don't even know what to say about it. I'm so concerned. I go. I spend time in the morning with one of my cats. She's a blind cat. And I spend an hour with her. I try to stay off the phone. I just try to focus on things. And sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm talking to her. I'm hanging out with her. I'm petting her. She's blind, right? So I talk to her a lot so she knows where I am. I walk around. So she follows me. And then I start thinking about what they did to Pluto and how they deprive Pluto of being a planet. And I'm just telling you. And, you know, I try not to get upset about it because cats can pick up on these vibes. Right. And I don't want Ruggles to think that I'm upset. I don't want her to get, you know, because she'll pick it up. She'll notice. Right. And I stop thinking about Pluto. I stop thinking about what they did. But why just just leave Pluto alone? What the hell is who can let Pluto be a planet? Just leave the leave Pluto the hell alone. Damn it. Pluto. Someday, someday will Pluto will will join the ranks of being called a planet again. Pluto identifies as a planet. How's that? How's that? And I recognize Pluto's right to identify as a planet. Okay? That's all I got to say on that subject matter. Breaks my heart. Exactly, Wendy. <laughs> Breaks my heart. They got no business treating Pluto like that. All right, let's see. So I'm not going to read the rest of it, but damn it. I was going to read this myself and just like record it as a video. And I'm like, hell no, we should just read this together. It's a lot more fun. Probably take us half a freaking year, right? The Jetsons agree with me. That's good. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, so I'm just, I'm not going to read this, but I'm just going to tell you what you guys have to look forward to. I don't know when the hell we're going to do this because tomorrow we're doing the Black Dahlia. And, um, and next week... I don't know how many of these I'm going to do because I want to really record a lot of videos. And what I might do is I might record a bunch of videos and then have as a premiere and hang out in the chat with you guys because you guys have so much freaking fun. I'm sitting here. I'm drinking my coffee. I'm choking to death. I got to figure out when I could take a sip. Like now. And uh, I got, you know, I got grapes. I got coffee. I got my Rubik's Cube. I've got my spicy candies. You know, and I, I stare at them. I can't suck on the candy because God knows what that'll sound like, right? You don't certainly do not want any sucking sounds coming from this end, that's for sure. Um, over socialization, that's next. And then after over socialization, okay, he continues on with the leftist stuff. It doesn't end, by the way, he keeps on going. Uh, and then he talks the, the power process. And then he gets into surrogate activities. Uh, when he says surrogate activities, that does not mean implanting the eggs of an egg donor uh, into your woo-woo and uh, carrying a baby. Although, by the way, uh, that is going to be a future strange history show. 
we're going to do, we're doing lots of criminal type stuff, right? True crime and stuff. But we're going to start getting into more social stuff and art stuff and architecture and, and all kinds of cool stuff. So I want to do the strange history of sperm donation, the strange history of egg donation, and the strange history of surrogacy. I think that'll be an interesting subject. I really do. Especially considering the majority of my subscribers are female. That should not scare men away, by the way. That should attract men, if you don't mind. So for all the gentlemen listening, this is the, let me tell you something. This is a cool place to be. We are surrounded by cool women, smart women, fun women, intelligent women. Trust me, we got a good crowd of chicks here, if you don't mind. Chicks. And uh, what's the equivalent for a male term of chick? So women don't uh, offended by the word chick. Guys, is guys that right? Dude, dude. Is that good? What are you guys? What's your favorite word? So, yeah. So we're going to do that. And um, the woo-woo show. Yeah. You still have your Harold and the Purple Crayon book, do you? Do you really? So I'm not the only one. That's very cool, Leah. Very cool. So, yeah. So we're going to do shows like that. Dicks. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> That's not nice. Hunks. Nobody says hunks anymore. Hunks. What was the guy's name in Porky's? The biggest dude. Oh, Meat. His name was Meat. Wasn't there a movie or something? Somebody's name was Hunk. What was Hunk from? Hunk. I don't know what Hunk was from. Anyway, dudes and dudettes, stud. I'm not calling a guy stud. Listen, imagine somebody tuning in for the first time. All right? And, and, you know, God knows I have enough trouble attracting men to my channel. And I don't know why. Okay? With all, the, with all the chicks I have here, you would think men would be bursting down the damn doors, right? So imagine some guy tunes in for the first time, and I'm saying, and for all the hunks listening, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, um, and for all this, the chicks and studs listening, nah. Come on, help me out here. Not saying stud, not saying hunk. All right, bro. I say bro. I say bro. I say cat, cool cat, cool cat. I say cat a lot. I actually stopped saying it because I thought it's too slangy. There's a lot of slang I don't use because I'm like, no one's going to know what the hell I'm talking about. So I toned down on the slang. You have friends who have spent over $50,000 to conceive their son. Then they paid thousands on storage fees for two years on the embryo for their daughter. Yeah, listen, honestly, all things considered, I don't see that as an unreasonable cost at all. And, uh, not the slightest bit. Um, we'll talk about that, though, when we do the show. It's a it's an interesting sub stallions. <laughs> oh, beefcake. Oh, my God. Ladies, please don't make me start writing these down beefcake and uh, Jeff, for all the guys listening uh how would you feel you tune into this sh the show and i'm and i'm referring to men as beefcakes beefcakes and stallions no no we'll come up i i think bros dudes cats uh all right so anyway surrogate activities we're going to do that and we're going to get back into art stuff too I have some bedtime stories I want to do. I'm trying just not to scare get guys away. Oh, guys. I'm trying not to scare the beefcakes away, the stallions away from my channel. And I'm thinking the bedtime stories, which people have been asking me to do forever, is just going to scare them away because it's going to be like, what's wrong with this dude? Right? And so, but I have some good ideas. Like what I thought I would do. I shouldn't even tell you this because then it obligates me to do it. But I want to write a series of bedtime stories where I bring you into paintings, where, you know, like we talked about the Van Gogh, right? The Terrace Cafe. And so I would write like a short story, like a bedtime story, very quiet, you know, the whole thing with um, campfire sounds, right? And it's like, I bring you into Arl, right? And you're walking through the street and then you work your way to the terrace and you sit down at the table and you are actually one of the people that Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh is painting. So you actually are in that painting, right? So you're sitting at the cafe. So I thought about doing that. I haven't done it yet, obviously, but I was thinking about doing that. But I like the articles. I just don't want to scare guys away, you know? 
Uh, it's like, you know, it's crazy. I have like almost 30,000 subs and like three of them are men. You know, I need more guys. No more, more men. Men are cool. We need more men around here. Men, join the club. Hang out with us. Um, can I start tonight? No, I got to write it first. But well, I do have the articles. I think the articles about H.H. Uh, Holmes, I've done those. And Jack the Ripper, there's so freaking many. And they're good. You know, for those of you who are listening to the Jack the Ripper script, uh, live stream, I mean, they're so well detailed. They're so beautifully written. Yeah. And so I thought, well, we'll do that. Those are kind of cool. So autonomy, that's another one. And then source of social problems. You know, I'm really glad we're reading this. I don't know if you guys like this, that I'm reading this. But this is interesting to read because, like I said, um, you know what? Let me jump over to, I want to read something really quick about this manifesto. Because the reviews like are really freaking good. I don't know how many people had anything bad to say about it, to be honest with you. Let me go, let me go to our friends at Wikipedia, because that, that was the thing where I said um, what they said about it. Hold on, legacy. Uh, where is that? Manuscript. No, 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 no. After publication, private investigator, la di da, CBS News. Leg oh, legacy. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Uh, wait, no, that's not it either. You know, it's interesting. It says that his um, this manifesto inspired online communities. Right? You have entire... Let's see. But there was one thing here I thought I read where it compared it to... Did you know that they wanted him... They considered him to be a person of interest for the Chicago... Tylenol murders. I wonder if the, well, the Chicago Tylenol murder, the Tylenol thing. I didn't realize that was that early. It wasn't that a long time ago. When was the whole Tylenol thing? Wasn't that in the 80s? Or, or it was a, that was a long time ago. So I don't know what the Chicago Tylenol thing is. Let's see. When the hell was, maybe I didn't see it here. After publication, investigation. Oh, 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 here it is. Contemporary reception. Listen to this, you guys. So in 1998, New York Times op-ed wrote, this is a quote, if this is, if it, this is the manifesto, if it is the work of a madman, then the writings of many political philosophers, Jean-Jacques uh, Jean Rousseau, Tom Paine, Karl Marx are scarcely more sane. Wow. Listen to this. The Unabomber does not like socialization, technology, leftist political causes, or conservative attitudes. Apart from his call for an unspecified revolution, his paper resembles something that a very good graduate student might have written. Right? Alter Chase, a fellow alumnus of Harvard University, wrote in 2000 for The Atlantic that, and this is a quote, it is true that many believe Kaczynski was insane because they needed to believe it. But the truly disturbing aspect of Kaczynski and his ideas is not that they are so foreign, but that they are so familiar. He argued that, this is another quote, we need to see Kaczynski as exceptional, madman or genius, because the alternative is so much more frightening. Wow. And then, uh, let's see. So, yeah, so, I mean, but like I said, I, I heard things where they said this is like the equivalent of 1984, a brave new world. It really is fascinating, right? When you consider that something like this would normally, what's a, What's a good way to say this without sounding like a douchebag? Nobody would have ever read this in the world if he didn't do what he did, right? He would have been just another smart dude who published some book that almost nobody would have read, right? And so it makes you wonder if perhaps this was his ultimate goal at any time, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to be considered to be insane. I'm going to go to prison, you know, for the rest of my life. But this work 
uh, which, you know, it's a manifesto, right? And so he felt it was important enough for people to be able to read and he wanted to, um, to do. And it makes you wonder if somebody like Ted Kaczynski really considers prison to be much of a punishment, right? I mean, think, he's living uh, in, in, in very, very, uh, I don't want to say dire circumstances, but yeah, pretty dire circumstances. The guy's got no electricity, he's got no plumbing now, but by his own choice, right? By his own choice. But at the same time, it's not like, you know, he's that dude in South Carolina or he's not O.J. Simpson. You know, he's not somebody who's like rolling in dough and living the high life. And it's such a shock to him to be able to be put in, in prison. If you guys remember, when we talked about, uh, what's his name? Uh, Charles Manson. When Charles Manson went to prison and, you know, he had been in, he'd been in and out of prisons his whole life, even when he was a kid, right? He was in um, juvie, right? Uh, juvenile detention, right? Juvie. And so I, I, he did an interview at one point. And he said something like, you think this is punishment for me? He goes, I've been institutionalized my whole life. He goes, I understand this world. He goes, I'm comfortable in this world. It's out there that I can't figure out. He goes, this I know. He goes, this is where I belong. He goes, I, this, is, this is structure. He goes, this, I get all this. This is, this is not punishment. You're putting me in prison is not punishment. This is my world. This is where I'm from. This is where I was, you know, uh, this is my home. Which is a crazy thing to say, but but isn't it the truth? And so Ted Kaczynski, at some point, if you well, what the hell? Uh, if I go to prison, what the hell's the worst thing? I, I get food, I have a toilet, I get the shower, I get exercise, and I don't have to think about anything anymore. And maybe he was tormented, maybe, about killing people. Right? Maybe he figures, well, you know what? I killed people. I've, de I've destroyed some lives. I don't know if he ever showed any kind of remorse. Right? I don't know. But maybe he did. And maybe he thought, all right, well, look, you know what? I belong in jail. And so what, what's the worst that could happen? I'll spend the rest of my life reading, what, which is what he's doing now. What the hell was the difference between living in his cabin and being in prison outside of um, the fact that he can't go walking in the woods or whatever, which he didn't seem to enjoy all that much anyway anymore? Right. And and uh, and the amount of stress and anxiety that he was having. <laughs> no chicks. Yeah, no chicks is a problem. But uh, from what we've been able to, I think, determine based on uh, what we know of his life, uh, chicks didn't seem to be playing much of a important uh, role in his life. So then he gets into disruption of the power process in modern society. And then, good God, this is long. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you the highlights and then get the hell out of here so I can give my cat some fluid. But let me see how much further I can get. How about, how would some people adjust? Then it gets into that. Wow, this would take a long time to read. Then he gets into the motives of scientists. Wow. Oh, this is going to be good. Oh, man, you guys, this is going to be good. If you've not hit the like button right by now, I don't know what the hell you're waiting for. Hit the freaking like button. It'll take you a second. Hit the like button. It costs you nothing. Nothing. It costs you nothing. I don't know why some people don't do it. Scott, why don't you do Trolls of the Century? Uh, well, let's see. I don't know. Uh, we had shows that had 88,000 views, 100,000 views, tens of thousands of views, 50,000, 60,000 views. People couldn't take a second to hit the damn subscribe button. So Scott can do 9 to 12 hours of research for a show. Uh, but I guess it's not a two-way street. I guess it's not a two-way street. I guess it's too much work to hit the damn like button. And subscribe. Please subscribe. Become a member. Uh, then the nature of freedom. So there's that. And then some principles of history. It's almost done here. Wait, actually, it's not. He's halfway through. Oh, God. Some principles of history. I don't know how we're going to do this, you guys. I might have to just like pick a time and say, look, We'll read for an hour and then that's it, you know, or whatever it is, you know, finish the last one. I won't stop like mid paragraph. And then we'll just keep doing a whole bunch of these over the course of time. But this is a, a massive undertaking. And then industrial technological society cannot be reformed. 
restrictions of freedom is unavoidable in industrial society. Oh, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. Oh, man. I almost like, I, you, know what, you, know what this, you know what this is like? This is like a really freaking good book. And you're laying in bed, lying in bed, lying in bed. Is it laying, lying, laying, lying? What do you chase? Laying. I'm laying in bed. I'm lying in bed. I'm laying, I'm lying, I'm laying. What is it? Is it laying in bed or lying in bed? What do you think? But anyway, um, and it's like, you don't want to go to sleep. It's like, I got to go to sleep. I got to wake up in the morning. It's like, no, no, no. Just one more page, one more page. All right. The bad parts of technology cannot be separated from the good parts. So we got that. And then technology is more is a more powerful social force than the aspiration for freedom. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Similar social problems have proved intractable. Okay. Revolution is easier than reform. Wow. What the hell does that mean? Oh, God. Revolution is easier than reform. You don't know if, it, if it's lying or laying or lying, 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 lying. Uh, control of human behavior. Damn. Talk about time travel. Let me tell you something. For those who are convinced correctly that we live in a computer simulation, there is a very good chance. You know, there's some people that have accessed the toolbox, as some of us like to say, to program the simulation. And it really makes you wonder if Ted Kaczynski has accessed the toolbox to program the simulation. How the hell? Was he able to write something that's it's incredible? Uh, human race at a crossroads. So we're going to get to that. And then something about human suffering. That sounds unpleasant. And then, the oh, the future. Oh, this will be, oh, this is going to be good. The future. Let's see what he has to say about that. Because this is like a think tank in many ways, right? This guy's like his own think tank unto himself. And strategy. That's good. And then getting towards the end here, getting towards the end. Let's see what else does he have to say. Come on, Ted. This is long. Oh, okay. Two kinds of technology. All right, we'll see what that means. And then the danger of leftism. Oh, yeah, remember earlier he said that he picks up again uh, at 2.13? Okay, so we got that part again. The danger of leftism is right there. And then... And then uh, let's see what else he got. I think that's it. And then he has a final notes. Okay. A final note. And then his notes go on forever. That, let me tell you, his notes are, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm actually done in a sec. Hold on. His notes are da, 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 36 paragraphs. Wait, are these his or is this? Yeah. Self-interested. Okay. He has 36 paragraphs of notes to read. And that's it. It's incredible. Incredible. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was an interesting sort of deep dive into the Unabomber. And it'll be quite an undertaking. So we'll try to figure out how to do it. People have been asking me since last summer to do live streams in the daytime. And especially because we have so many people that listen in Australia or, or um, well, ah, screw the damn Australians. Nothing but trouble. Just kidding. Uh, in, in the UK and stuff like that. And obviously, if I did a show like at lunchtime for me, which is like, you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, whatever. That's much easier for you guys. So might do some of those. And then we could do this. Or do some at night. Who knows? We'll bounce around. But this is kind of go low-hanging fruit because I don't have to use my brain all that much. I just got to read. I like that. I don't have to do any damn research. I'm just like, oh, I got to read the Unabomber Manifesto for children. Actually, wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> Maybe should they make a good children's book. 
Maybe not. You like evening streams? Yes, everybody hit the like button. Thank you, Susan of New Jersey. Thank you, everybody, for hitting the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Become a member. Please become a member. It takes you like a second and get your friends and family. Like I said the other day, have children. Pump out some kids, ladies. Pump them out. Do whatever you have to do. Guys, pump out. Get some women pregnant with the main objective being so they could form YouTube channels and subscribe to my channel. You could have your own reasons for having children, have them working on the farm, have somebody to take care of you in your old age. Those are perfectly valid reasons. Perfectly valid, nothing wrong with that at all. But one of the reasons when you put together your list of pros and cons for having children, one of the pros has to be to get them to subscribe to the Strange History um, channel. Seriously, you are, they're not going to want to go to college in 10 years, 20 years. It's so expensive. But imagine over the course of 20 years, they're 20 years old and they have all this great knowledge. They'll be 18 years old. They'll be able to recite from the Unabomber Manifesto, right? They'll know, they'll be experts on Jack the Ripper. They'll be experts on Van Gogh. They'll be experts on the Eiffel Tower and, and you know, buildings of major architectural and, and social, you know, social and historical significance. Think about all the cool things right? That these kids will learn. So definitely, that's what I would do. Pump out some kids. If you're Mormon and you have like seven kids, sign them all up. Don't do like some family YouTube channel. Each one of them, each one of them, okay? And they'll be married like in, you know, when they're 15 or something, and they'll be pumping out kids. I want a whole like Mormon army in our strange history, hey, uh, society. Is that all right? All righty. They can, write, they can write their own manifesto one day. Yes, exactly. In fact, let me give you all homework. I don't really want to give you homework, but this is a study hall. This is a study hall. Let's not ever forget that. We are here to learn. So your homework is to write your own manifesto and share it with your fellow strange historians in the near future. Start working it on it now, and we expect it to be done by the year 2033. And then we will all meet like um, we'll all meet like in Ireland or something at that that licking stone, the kissing stone, the Barney Rubble stone. What's that called? Blarney? Blarney? Let's go meet there. We will all go and lick and kiss the stone and they don't need to wipe it after each kiss. All right. We're a family here. It's OK. And and then we just gather around a fire and everybody reads from their manifesto. Yes, the Blarney Stone. I know. So how's that sound? Does that sound good to everybody? We've met at the Blarney Stone in 10 years. You better have your freaking manifesto done. I'm just saying. It doesn't have to be 230-something paragraphs. It doesn't have to be something the equivalent of the Unabombers. You could have your own manifesto. Okay? If it's just like a, a sheet, sheet of paper, Okay. But start working on it. It's very, very important. All right, you guys. I got to go give fluids to my kitty. So this concludes a strange episode of the strange history of the Unabomber. If you enjoyed the video, and we all know there's a very slight chance that you did, but if you did, uh, please hit the like button, share the video, subscribe to my channel, become a member of my channel. Kindly do yourself a favor. Go to a local shelter, adopt a cat or a dog or another furry friend. You'll be very, 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 super very, 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 very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys. Good night, everybody. <laughs>